Hi everyone, good evening and welcome to the Olympic Club here in San Francisco, California. Greg Mesco here with you for the 2023 Peter J. Catino Awards and we are here in the room where it will happen. We're taking you up to the start of our program here tonight at 7 p.m. local time when our MC Chris Dorst will get us started as we look ahead to honoring the best in the world of college water polo. This award named after, of course, the late legendary Cal head coach Peter Katina, who guided the Bears to so many NCAA championships and has become the namesake of this honor. Now, if this is your first time watching the Katina Awards or you're not familiar with this honor, it is like a lot of other awards that you're familiar with. If you follow other college sports, we often say the Katina Award, it's like the Heisman for water polo, or it's like the Naismith Award. If you think about college basketball or Hobie Baker, as we go through the other sports here, as you see a comparison on your screen of different awards from different sports, this is the importance. Why do we show you this comparison? If you've watched every year, you say to yourself, I see this slide every year. The point of it is to hammer home the importance of this award, right? Our feeling, people should know about this honor the way you know about those awards, not only when it comes to the water polo world, but the sports world at large. They should know, Katino Award, that means water polo excellence. So that's why we're here tonight, to help showcase and shine a spotlight on all the fantastic athletes that are nominated. We do have six of those. But let's talk about how do you win the Katino Award? Well, there's a voting process that happens, and uh, it's really up to the coaches. The way it works with the Katino Award is the college coach for each program in that gender gets a chance to vote. So in some cases, as we know, we do have programs in the college water polo world where one coach does lead both the men's and women's teams. They get a chance to vote for both. In other cases, you just vote for the gender in which you coach. So that's how we figure out our list. We whittle it down, right? Nominees come in, three finalists, and then votes are taken. Now, new this year, you may have heard about the Catino Award watch list. And just to fill folks in, that was released earlier in the season for the men's campaign and then the women's campaign. 20 athletes from around the country, again, voted on by coaches, were recognized. That was a separate process. So that was just a chance to recognize athletes that are performing at a very high level that may be in consideration for the Catino Award here at the end of the season. But two different voting processes and we're looking forward to the Catino Award watch list again next season. Just a way to, to shine a bright light on more college athletes around the country. Because as we know, there are only so many opportunities to be a finalist. And that's a chance to recognize more programs and more players. Now let's talk past winners. And we're going to hear from one of our past winners here tonight. Cammie Craig is the keynote speaker at the Catino Awards this year. She won the award twice. But here's a look back at all the various winners. And we've split this up here by by gender as you look back at who has won the honors and we start first on the women's side going back with uh, the furnace furnace or back in 1999 Coralie Simmons going to be honored next week as an inductee into the USA Water Polo Hall of Fame the great Brenda Villa the list goes on Natalie Golda Lauren Wanger as we continue through and uh, you see when it comes to winners sometimes we get repeats sometimes three peats and sometimes four peats Tony Azevedo winning four times in a row we often say that's probably never going to happen again but you never say never as of late it has become a theme uh, to get a couple of back-to-back -back winners you saw with Balash Day there from Pacific Ben Halleck has won twice as well uh, and we have the opportunity for a repeat this year the great Cal Bear Nikolaus Papa Nikolaou he won last year he is one of our finalists this year so a chance potentially we don't know who has won just yet uh, to see who will win the Catino Award we could have a repeat winner uh, we know for sure we'll have a new winner on the women's side. Speaking of our finalists, let's talk finalists. We start first with the women, and we know that the Stanford Cardinal are well represented. Ryan Neuschel, Aria Fisher, two of our three finalists. They're coming off of an NCAA championship victory last May in Stockton just a couple of weeks ago at the University of the Pacific. And the third member of that group, Tilly Kearns, she was in that final for USC. Tilly, the Australian native, the only finalist unable to join us here tonight. We have a great turnout as five of the six are here in the room with us tonight. On the men's side, the University of the Pacific, they host the women's tourney. They're represented here on the men's side. Ruel D'Souza, the sophomore, coming off a great season in the GCC for Pacific. He's one of our finalists, Jake Earhart, the fifth year senior for USC. Another capping a tremendous run for the men of Troy now off to big things with Team USA. And then as we mentioned, our reigning Catino Award winner, 
Nikolaus Papa Nikolaus coming off just a ridiculous season in 2022. Who could forget his seven goals in the NCAA championship final? So that sets the table for tonight. We have a great night ahead. Again, we're going to take you up to the start of our program at 7. We'll pass it off to Chris Dorst. He'll get us started. While the rest of the good folks here in the room are eating dinner, we'll take it back and we'll talk with a host of guests in the room, including all five finalists that are here with us. We also got some messages from Tilly Kearns ahead of time, so she'll share her thoughts on what it means to be a Catino Award finalist yet again. She was a finalist last year. But in the meantime, we'll take a quick break. When we return, looking to catch up with two-time Catino Award winner and our keynote speaker, Cammie Craig. We're just getting started on a great night here in San Francisco. The Catino Awards, live here on the USA Water Polo YouTube channel, continues after this break. And we're back here in the room at the Olympic Club. Looking forward to a great night celebrating the best in college water polo. Speaking of college water polo greatness and Olympic greatness, Cami Craig. Cami, typically we, we rope you in to host this show, but you're the keynote speaker tonight. You have yes. to rest your voice. We can't have you talking too much. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thanks for being here. Yes. Give us a little, a little sneak peek. What, what are you going to try and tell this room uh, when you get up there to give your keynote remarks? Well, I don't want to give away too much yes, of the details, correct. but really yeah. just connecting with these athletes and the journey that they've been on. Uh, the Katina Awards is interesting because it comes at the end of you know the collegiate school year and season, and it's not really something, at least in my experience, that's like top of mind or front of mind when you're in season. You're focused on being a good teammate, being a good leader, being a good individual. And then it's kind of the cherry on top at the end of everything. You're like, well, OK, the Katina Awards are here. Yeah. And cool, I got nominated. And I'm amongst you know, some of these amazing players. So um, it's always such a great celebration of what these athletes have kind of worked through and kind of a joy at the end of it all. You know, you bring up such a good point because I, I think from like a media lens, we think about awards and you can just get carried away with the excitement around, sure. oh my, you're a finalist, who's going to win? And you talk to so many athletes and they really don't care yeah. when they're in the middle of the season. <laughs> and so, especially for the women, right? They just finished the season. That's so right. So they've had maybe two weeks to process that they'd be finalists. And so often, if you didn't accomplish the team goal, mm. the individual one is not as sweet. You know, I'm curious, you won it twice, mm -hmm. once after you didn't win a championship and once yep. after you did. did. Did that change your feelings at all about it? Yeah, I think either whether you end on a high note or a low note, I think taking, uh, receiving an award without a team behind you because you're always in a team environment. You're yeah. always used to, you know, stepping into something with the group behind you. And so it's always a little bit interesting of a feeling because there's no way 
any of us as you know great athletes become you know who we are without our teammates pushing us challenging us and you know putting us in a position to be you know at an event like this to win such a great award like this and um, so it's always a little bit kind of like oh okay all of a sudden I'm, I've stepped away from the team I'm standing here alone and you know a lot a lot of these speeches come back to like I couldn't have done it without my team yeah yeah, yeah. and I, I imagine that's the theme of what we'll hear whoever wins tonight and we have five great finalists in the room another couldn't be here it is interesting in a team sport because Two folks will be asked to get up there and say some things about themselves yes. when it is such a team-focused environment. Yes. But you work really hard to be really good and to, and to earn all these things and to help your team be successful. Is there a part and, and what message would you give to these athletes? Like, Can they let themselves enjoy this a little bit that this is an individual thing that they're being singled out for? Doesn't mean they don't support their team and love their teammates, but yes. shouldn't they have a little time to say like, I worked really hard, I did earn this. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, you know, as I prepared for this event, I took a look at kind of who the past uh, winners have been of this award. Um, I, I realized, you know, how, like how long I've been yeah. in the game, <laughs> like how long I've been around. And yeah. even looking at the list of women, I've either been coached by, played against, or played alongside every single woman on that list, yeah, yeah. which are all contributors to the success. And I think, you know, you as an individual, you want to be, you want to lead by example. You want to be a great teammate. You want to be a great individual. And it takes self responsibility and accountability to do that. And I think as I look at the time and the history of this, um, it's important every once in a while to lift your head up and celebrate the small successes and the large successes as well. And this is definitely a large success to celebrate for yourself tonight. Uh, there's no doubt. Uh, an, an awesome night to really celebrate college water polo and to celebrate the game in itself. And it's interesting, we talked about women's sports over the last five, six years and how it's, it's more and more in the spotlight, deservedly so, right? Mm -hmm. The teams that you were on with Team USA really helped push it forward when it, when it comes to water polo. How important is it to just celebrate the sport and to not miss a moment to highlight, let's talk about the women's game specifically, to not miss a chance to highlight all the great things women yeah. are doing in water polo. Yeah, I think especially from the seat now, just taking that beat to, you know, I think it, it goes by so fast. And if you don't take the moments to celebrate kind of all those micro steps that lead to where you are today, you know, you could be in my position and take a look <laughs> at that list and go, holy cow, like, you know, where did it go? It happened yeah. so quickly and yeah. I think, um, you know, the, the progression of women's sport and women's water polo specifically, um, it, it deserves to be acknowledged along the way and I know where we want to go and, you know, when you're working with elite performers, they love to keep their heads down until they get there. Um, and so it's nice for events like this uh, to slow us down and to pause us so that we can in fact celebrate. Last thing I'll ask you, because yes. I know you have, to, you have to rest up, get the, get the warm tea, and yes. just kind of go, you go into a quiet space and gather your thoughts. Uh, Cam, you're a keynote speaker here tonight. But if, if you think about those, those women, right? So, mm -hmm. the, so the 20 women are all the, the ones that you had kind of connected with in some way that ended up winning this honor. And if you look at that list, right, it's a lot of Olympic medals, too. Yes. It's a lot of national championships. Is there a through line about them, the way they carry themselves, the way they were as teammates, the way they prepared to play water yeah. polo, that you can kind of say this is a commonality among all of them. Yeah, I think it's interesting when I think about the culture and history of water polo here in the U.S. and you asking about that through line is, you know, even myself just looking at that list and knowing that I've been kind of impacted or experienced one thing or another with each of those athletes on that list, there is that ability to kind of pass the torch and teach best practices. And I think, you know, there is a culture at large of just kind of that commitment and discipline and ability to kind of show up and be fundamentally sound and uh, to push yourself in different ways. But I think for sure there's just been this kind of beautiful handoff culture um, and kind of guidance. I think, you know, I feel the support within USA Water, or Women's USA uh, Water Polo and that ability to want to ensure that we keep pushing uh, as we grow. Yeah, good stuff, Cammie. Well, more from Cammie. If you like what you heard here, <laughs> stick around because she's going to be back with more with the keynote address here later on tonight. But uh, Cammie, thanks for being here. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you. All right, we'll take another time out. We'll come back with one of our Catino Award finalists. We're here at the Olympic Club in San Francisco. 
2023 Catino Award presentation. We'll introduce you to the two winners of the best award in college water polo after we come back. Welcome back here to the Olympic Club on Post Street right here in the city in San Francisco. Greg Meskel here with you as we continue our Catino Award live presentation. Taking up for the start of our program, we've got one of our finalists, Jake Earhart here. Thanks for being here with us. Thanks for having me, Greg. Excited uh, to be here. Yeah, Jake, this is awesome, man. Congrats to you. Uh, heck of a career at USC. Five years, what a run. Yeah. Have you had a moment to kind of just think back on what these five years have been like for you? Yeah. You know, it's been quite a journey. And five years seems like a really long time, but yeah. thinking back on it, it really flew by. You know, I've made a lot of good memories there. And looking back, I just couldn't be happier with the decision that I made five years ago to go to USC. You think back to that first season, and, and Jake has the hardware. He has, he has, he has the national championship ring uh, here with him. You win that title in the first year, and then you become a mainstay at USC. You look at the numbers here, and I was just looking at some of the data, right? sixth all-time in scoring USC. That is a crowded list of talented players. When you think back at that first year, what, what did you hope for yourself? Did, no. you, did you ever imagine where you'd end up when you talk about the impact you made at USC? Yeah. You know, I had hopes to win multiple championships, and that's always the goal when you go to a place like USC, especially hearing that from the coaches even before you get there. You're coming here to win rings, and they almost guarantee you rings coming in because it's such a tough program and yeah. you know program that's stood for a really high culture for so long. Um, but you know, for those early practices, I remember looking up at the banners and seeing some of the great players that played there, and I really just wanted to make the entire like Trojan family proud, and that was my main goal and to make my teammates proud. So I I think looking back on that, we did a pretty good job of that. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. Now. We were talking about it before, right? That that ring was the first one. You got there other times. It didn't it didn't go your way. Yeah. Are you able to to take satisfaction in that you were on a team that was one of the best every year, or is that hard to process because you you wanted to be the one that won the title? Yeah. No, I think it's tough to process uh, a couple of days, weeks, you know, even months after it happens. But when you get a chance to step back, like a moment like today. You really think how proud you are, and you're pretty happy with you know everything that happened. When you get the news that you're a finalist for an award like this, and Cammy yeah. was just talking about a fellow Trojan, that it's such a reflection on the team around you. When the word gets out, Jake Earhart, a finalist, what's the response you're hearing from people in your water polo world? Yeah. You know, um, I think a lot of people are really happy to hear that we had a finalist this year, and 
you know, you know, not to say I didn't expect it, but it's not something that I thought about for the entire season. So to kind of hear it happen after, you know, it was a nice surprise. Um, yeah, you know, it's it's bit, the whole season was bittersweet the way it ended. Yeah, but you know, I'm happy to be here and I'm on great company. You know, and I. I could see why you'd say that because a lot of players say that they're not they're not thinking about this right you're yeah. thinking about the end goal and trying to win a championship yeah you, you look at your run at usc and any any player on usc falls into this problem where there's so much depth and so much talent yeah. that it's not easy to be the guy that everyone's focusing on right if you think about to your to your earliest seasons there I'm talking just pure offense right a jacob mirchev eventually a guy like Hannes, right yeah. they might get more of the notoriety early on yeah. um what is it about that program that if you stick with it, you eventually get your opportunity? I think back to the last 20 years of USC water polo. As guys matured into their junior and senior years, they maybe weren't the go-to guy as freshmen or sophomores, but if they st stood in there, they got their chance. Yeah. yeah, no, especially at USC, you know, every day in practice, everybody's getting an opportunity to play and to make an impact on the game. So for me, Early on, with big players like Mercep, ba Marko Babic, obviously sure. Hannes, early, my role was different. But as you know, the time went on, my role really changed to more of an offensive threat, and that's what I needed to be. So, kind of step in the role as best you can. Team USA, you're you're now segueing into training with that yep. group, and tell me what that process has been like for you to kind of take on a bigger role with with the U.S. and yep. what what your ambitions are with the United States. Yeah. So right now that's my main focus is making that team and being an impact player on that team. And we're in training right now. So it's actually nice to kind of just take a break this weekend and reset a little bit. But I'm just hoping to, you know, be a, be a good impact player on that team and as a defender, play tough and, you know, earn the respect of not only my teammates but the rest of the world. How challenging is it, and um, I'm kind of – getting at the comparison here right to you're recruited to play at USC they want you to be on that team and then it's your job to kind of carve out your role whereas with the national team everyone's trying to kind of recruit themselves to be a part of it how difficult are the two to carve out your role at USC and then to try to show you belong with Team USA yeah. yeah no it's it's definitely a different challenge with USA you got to make yourself known and you got to immediately show your worth on the team in the water so I think that's definitely something that I had to uh, figure out and I think these past few years uh, going on more trips and being a part of more trainings I've learned to not be afraid to you know show your skills so your talents in the water and really just show the entirety of your game do you think about Paris today is that is that top of mind or is it about the next tournament how do you process your team USA journey yeah I think there's there's multiple depths to what you think about every day. So on a day-to-day -day basis, it's what can I do today to make myself better? But in the back of your mind, you know, the end goal is to make, obviously, that Paris team and to help push our team forward to hopefully a medal. So, you know, that is in the back of my mind. But on a day-to-day -day basis, try to focus on the small things. Are you headed to play overseas at any point in the future? Yeah, so I uh, actually just signed with Sabade. Oh, congratulations. Yeah, That's thank fantastic. You very much. So I'm very excited to go over there yeah. and start my first uh, season as a professional player. Very cool, very cool. Well, last thing for you, you know, anyone that gets to this stage often thanks their family, right? And whether they win or not, if they get a chance to speak at that podium, they're going to have some yeah. things to say about their family. I happen to notice I've talked to him many times. Your dad is a huge supporter of yeah. everything you do and of water polo. Yeah. I'm sure there are many more in your family, but yeah. what has your family meant to you yeah. in this whole journey? You know, it's, it's tough to put into words sometimes, but my dad, my parents, and my family as a whole has been such a support through this whole process. It's funny, they actually surprised me here tonight. I didn't think they were going to be able to make it. <laughs> That's great. But I just saw them down in the reception. Oh. So that was a really nice surprise. <laughs> um, they just been so instrumental in supporting me, ups and downs. I think for any athlete who plays plays any sport for a long time, you need to have a, a good supporting group behind you, and they've been more than that for me. So you know, I'm going to be thanking them all night long, and every time I look over and see my parents here, it just you know makes me smile. That's awesome, yeah. uh, Jake Hart. Awesome to talk with you, bud. Thank you very much. Good luck Greg. tonight, and we'll see you down the road. Okay, thank you, Greg. We'll take a quick time out. We'll come back. Ryan Newshall joins us here momentarily.
They need to score. Lola, we need you. Get in there. But wait, Coach Kerforian has just subbed in their secret weapon. Lola the dog. She shoots. She scores! Yeah! Which one, yellow? Yellow. Now, blue? No, orange. Now, blue. And we're back in the room, as you can tell by the sound, starting to fill up here. We're getting close to the start of our presentation here at the Olympic Club. Greg Meskel here with you with one of our finalists, Ryan Neuschel. Ryan, thanks for being here. Yeah, thank you for having me. Now, Ryan, last time I talked to you, you had just gotten out of the pool in Stockton, put on a headset to describe what just happened. You've had a couple of weeks now. Take me back to that night at the University of the Pacific. What, what stands out about that NCAA championship win for the card? Yeah, I think just the resilience of that game and the team in general, just kind of having bursts of great moments. I think I talked about this that night, like really clustered, but um, <laughs> moments of greatness, moments of not great quarters, um, but really just being resilient in the end and making the game winning plays, like that final pass and stuff like that that just kept us going and got us the win. We were talking about that play for a while afterwards and that and that last pass and the Ella Woodhead goal and it was interesting. That that to me was such an example of of the balance of the Stanford team. Ella did not score all night. Uh, I maybe took a shot. What is it about the culture your team has built that you felt comfortable to give her the ball and she felt comfortable to shoot it? Yeah, I think one of the great things about Stanford is we really do treat everyone the same. Everyone on any team has the same value. And Ella, in that moment, doesn't matter whether you've won three national championships, a gold medal, whatever, like, ball is in your hand, you're open, it's your shot and your yeah. opportunity. And it was amazing to see Ella do that um, and have that moment. And as a team, it just brings you energy when you know you're getting contributions across the board. I think even Celeste Weinbelt, who's yeah. a defender on our team, came up for us that night. and that. Honestly, those moments are what got me into that game because yeah. it's so cool and it's truly a team win when you get that across the board contribution. And that's ultimately what led us to win those games in the end. And I want to be accurate. Was it Jenna Flynn that passed to Ella Woodhead? Yes. It was, yes, okay. it was Jenna. So everyone, it was, before it was we get the comments. Freshman to freshman yes, pass. Yes, freshman to freshman, yes, amazing. Okay, yes. we have that correct. Second straight championship for Stanford. You had another to bring home to, to Santa Barbara. What, how would you describe the expectation of a Stanford team to win a title? When you start the year, people expect you to be good from the outside. What's the internal pressure to be great and to win? Yeah, I think it doesn't really matter how many times you've done it. Yeah. You always feel the pressure. I think yeah. people assume, you know, oh, if you played in a lot of big games, then it doesn't really phase you, but it only phases you more. You kind of take that heat on, and definitely, I think, that pressure of back-to-back -back titles and you know what we lost like obviously Mackenzie Fisher is one of the best players to ever play the game and losing her was a huge uh, deficit for us so just a lot of those details coming into the season I know I felt a lot of pressure of how is this team going to come together and we know we need more contributions across the board are we going to be able to get that and, and get that from all the people on the team and it was amazing to see that happen and I think we sort of took that pressure to win the back-to-back -back title and said, you know what, instead of feeling like we need to get this win, we're going to flip it on its head and say, hey, we're underdogs coming into this season. Like, we're playing a USC team in these finals that has the same roster as two years from now. So 
how are we going to reframe this to make ourselves not feel as much pressure? Yeah. And I think that was a great thing we did as a team. Now, does that work? Because like the outside person would say, you can call yourselves underdogs. Yeah. And we're not buying it. But in the locker room, does that sort of, I think teams have to, you have to sometimes not, not play tricks on yourself, right? But you have to figure out a way to stay motivated. Does that idea of painting yourself as something to prove, that seems like it works. Yeah, I think, um, you know, we, yeah, we had a, USC had an amazing game against us in yeah. that conference play and beat us. And so I think that really kicked us into high gear. And we thought, you know, okay, we are not unstoppable. We are really, we have some like kink in the armor here. We have things to work on. And just looking back on that game and also at MPSF, even though that game went well and we won the finals and the semifinal, like we still walked away from that saying, okay, this isn't over yet. It's not done. Job's not done. We're not done yet. And I think having that constant like competitive mentality. Competitors, no matter how many times they've won, it's only, you're only as good as your next game. And I think that's what we channeled and that's what we needed. So who cares about our MPSF title? We want an NCAA title. Yeah. And that's sort of what fueled us. How special is it to share the night tonight with Aria? Oh my gosh. So near and dear to my heart. I'm going <laughs> to... You know, I'll walk away from the season having an NCAA title, and I, and I love that, and with one of the best, if not the best center to play the game. And But what I'll remember most is our friendship that we had this season. Um, Aria is so close to me. I've played against her since I was like nine years old in club water polo, and I'm always going to remember those moments with her. And having this last season with her was just amazing. I couldn't ask for anything better. It, it seems like the percentages are in your favor tonight. If you win or she wins, it should be a good night for the Cardinal. Totally. Yeah. I, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm rooting for Aria here. I yeah. think she put up a season that's just like uncomparable, incredible to watch and be a part of. Um, but you know what? I'm going to be excited for whoever wins. Um, we won the title. Yeah. That's at the end of the day. That's what uh, that's what you want. So now you'll step away from Stanford and focus on Team USA. What's your plans here over the next year or two? Yeah, I mean, I think the plan is hopefully just keep keep making rosters, keep yeah. making the team, and continue to make the team as good as we can. You know, obviously with Team USA, you always got the pressure to win. So hopefully we can do that at Worlds this summer. But just staying. Um, humble, staying competitive, staying ready to go. It's my goal, always. We talked about expectations. You, you're a neutral. You're supposed to be good at water polo, right? You're the third one through the door here. Kylie, yeah. Jamie, and now yourself. Your sisters accomplished all those things, right? Champions, uh, Olympic gold medalists. How, how do you blaze your own path and kind of just do, do you? Yeah, it's a difficult question because if you look at us on paper, you know, we kind of did the same thing. Yeah. So we went to Stanford, and then we eventually played with the national team. And so it's pretty easy to think, oh, you, you really are doing the same things, but we're just different people and we're different players, you know? And I think for me, being seven and five years apart from Kylie and Jamie is just, I always felt like I was a child that had something to prove, like a rebel, <laughs> the young kid energy. Like, okay, yeah. I'm going to be different, even yeah. though I'm doing, you know, similar things sure. to you. And I think that comes out in my play. It's, it's a little different than Kylie and Jamie. Sometimes for the better and sometimes <laughs> not for the better. But yeah, I think just sort of knowing, OK, this is who I am. And yeah, I have sisters who are incredible and did amazing things and, and blazed trails for me to follow. But how am I going to make this my own? And I don't know, just do that by being my authentic self as best I can. No, it's a really good point. Look. Hey. It's hard to argue with going to Stanford or trying to be an Olympian. I think yeah. those are things that many would want to pursue, so I, I wouldn't call that a copycat move. But you're right. It would be lazy for people to say you're all the same player. You're three different players or three different people, too, if anyone's yeah. talked to you. Last thing I'll touch on, family is such a big part of a night like this. Your mom has coached you and your sisters and hundreds of other young girls in Santa Barbara. I think Peter Neuschel has been at every water polo pool on the planet Earth. What, what have they meant to you in this whole road to, to water polo excellence? Yeah, well, my mother actually couldn't be here tonight because she is coaching uh, J.O. Falls. No surprise. Yeah, yeah. huge <laughs> tournament for the youth. Um, honestly, I wouldn't be sitting here without my mother and her efforts, and I know my sisters wouldn't either. So whenever I'm able, like, honored at something like this, which is just amazing, it's, it's all to my mom. You know, I look back to my mom like, handing me a cap when I was eight years old and like getting me into peewee water polo like when I was four so just 
I think of those memories and the opportunities she opened for me, um, also her being a female head coach, um, and for my dad just watching him support her and support three daughters, um, you know, as a, a man who played water polo, just wanting to open that door for young girls and women was inspiring. You see that from both a mom and a woman and my dad who's a man and who played this sport, you know, so yeah, I hope to continue the legacy they set. They set a really good one, so hopefully I can contrib like continue that. That's awesome. Sure. Well, uh, Ryan, you got like a small break from water polo, and now three games with the Greece coming up, the World Cup, World Championships. Yeah. We'll see a lot of Ryan Neutral soon. Thanks for being here. Good luck tonight. Thanks so much, Greg. Thank you, guys. All right, we'll take a timeout, and when we come back, we should send it off to Chris Doris to get our program underway. Francisco, the Peter J. Catino Awards, Greg Nestle here with you. We're getting close to the start of our program. Just a heads up, the way the rest of the night will go, we'll have our official program with our MC Chris Storrs coming up shortly. And then while the room breaks for dinner, we'll keep talking with members of uh, the finalists, our, our, our finalist group here. We've already spoken with Jake Earhart and Ryan Neuschel, and we're going to speak with Aria Fisher, Rel D'Souza, and Nicolas Papa Nicolau. We'll also hear from Tilly Kearns, we couldn't be here tonight, but we'll send in a message from Australia. So a lot more to come as we get closer to finding out who are our Katina Award winners. After the dinner, then we'll learn our winners, and we'll speak with the winners right here on our stage once 
we find out who they are. So we're just filling time right now, but that sounds like Chris Dorst, so we'll pass it over to him and get our program underway. Okay, folks, come on, come on in. We're not going to start without you, Nick. Don't worry. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, if you could all please be seated. and gentlemen. It's just like a bunch of water polo people to be yapping away while we're trying to start this thing up. You guys keep going. This is good. This is good. I'm not getting paid by the hour here, so you guys could take all the time you need. I got, I'll pay you afterwards. Thanks, Doug. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's start this thing off, shall we? Hey, Pete. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 24th annual Peter J. Katino Awards Banquet and Celebration. This has been going on for 24 years. I, it just boggles the mind when I think back to the early days of this. My name's Chris Dorst, I'll be your host for this evening. And this is the one time, this one event every year where the water polo community comes together. It is a privilege for me to be a part of this. I enjoy coming here and meeting up with older people, the young guys I don't recognize, but that's okay. A list of previous winners of the Katina Award is is located in your in your dinner program, as is a list of, of former speakers. Uh, you know, past speakers have included luminaries like Leon Panetta and John Fisher and and Peter Uberoth, as well as Pete Catino himself. Um, I think it's important that we personally thank the folks at the Olympic Club for hosting this and putting this on. Their uh, infatigable athletic director Nick Lusson. Eva, Whitney, Charlie back there with, the, with the, uh, the sound. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a big round of applause for the <laughs> Olympic Club. And not to be outdone, the Catino Award Board of Trustees, the people who actually came up with the idea and are making this thing happen. And I'd like to call out one person in particular, one of the original Catino Award trustees, Mr. Ed Rudloff, Jr. Ed, will you please stand? Without them, this would not be possible. This award would not have, have been a part of things. Jesse Figueroa is sitting right there. He was here at the very beginning. Good to see you, buddy. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's been a pretty amazing year. There, there were a couple of pretty exciting NCAA championships. Back in December, the Cal men beat USC 13 to 12, and you were down by, what, five or six in the fourth quarter at some point? Just four? Oh, just four. Gosh, that's hardly anything. But they were paced by seven goals from Nick, Papa Nicolau. Yeah, after a couple of beers, we'll see how that gets pronounced later on. But it's only 16 national championships for you guys, right, Kirk? Only 16? Yeah, gee, okay, you might want to share some with other people. This is a season you're sharing, right? 
And in Stockton a couple of weeks ago, the Stanford women beat USC 11-9 for, for their ninth NCAA championship. It's not bad. Internationally, the U.S. men took a silver at the FINA World League Superfinal last year. And the women, the women's national team, well, they won their fourth straight world championship in Budapest last year. They're still the number one team in the world, and they're, they've won every gold medal from Pan Ams to world championships to Olympics to World Cup. Both teams are hosting the World Aquatics Cup this summer. One's going to be in uh, Long Beach, the women, at the end of June. The men are going to be competing at USC a week later. If you folks are interested in world-class water polo right here in our backyard, you might want to think about heading down there. It's going to be some fabulous, fabulous competition. Not to be outdone, however, the Olympic Club men's team won the Spin Lob Classic over NYAC. Yeah. <laughs> who, who comes up with the names of these tournaments anyway? You know, they'll have the, the Bar Down Classic, the Bunnies Classic. The, it's just anti-goalie, that's all it is. And their 40 and over team is the current reigning Masters World Champion. So big applause for that. Now, at this point, it's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Jim Murphy, president of the club, who's going to say a few welcoming remarks. Jim? Jim Murphy, and um, I have the honor of being the president of the Olympic Club this year, and also the honor of addressing you tonight in connection with the Peter J. Catino Award. The Olympic Club um, loves its volleyball program, and the volleyball, <laughs> volleyball, <laughs> water polo program. The last time I was in the water was shortly before Jaws, so. Uh, I'll remember water polo. But, but the board of directors of the Olympic Club uh, honors our tradition, and I want to recognize our board members here tonight, Malia Lyle and Kevin Lee. I also want to recognize past president, Marcus Colabianchi, whose daughter is a water polo water polo player at St. Ignatius High School, and of course, former President Ed Rudloff, who was instrumental in the Peter Catino Award. <clears throat> Mar Marcus reminded me tonight that the Peter J. Catino Award given to the outstanding men and women's Division I water polo players is the Heisman Trophy of water polo. The Heisman Trophy, as you all know, or maybe don't know, uh, originated the Downtown Athletic Club in New York. And it, it always uh, is interesting to see winners and potential winners try to emulate the stance right, of the Heisman Trophy winner. I, I don't know if I could do the water polo, but it's a great sport. I enjoy watching it. Above the water, I understand below the water is a little different. But welcome to the Olympic Club. Congratulations to all the nominees. Have a great night, and thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. OK, no volleyball jokes from here on in. I... No worries, Jim. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this year, uh, again, the water polo family has been rocked by the passing of some more of our friends, colleagues, and teammates. I'll call your attention to the video screens on the side for a, a uh, little memorial.
Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, in, in lieu of a moment of silence, I say we applaud for a couple of, a couple of more seconds for those folks. They were great contributors, great teammates, and great. You know, we're here to honor the best water polo players in the country, but first we have to, we have to identify some honored guests that we have in our midst. Um, first and foremost, you know, we wouldn't be here without the Catino family. Anna Catino is sitting over here at table, table 11 with John. Please, please stand up. Anna's carries on the family tradition. Thank you so much for being a part of this. She's been at every single one, and I won't tell you how old she was when I first met her. In addition to this, ladies and gentlemen, we have the privilege of working with USA Water Polo, their live stream broadcast. And I gotta tell you, the hardest working man in show business, the vocal stylings of Greg Meskel. Greg is here with us today. Let's Jake, can you capture that applause for later on? He kind of run it as a laugh track, just so that people think he's. We, uh, we also typically have generations of Olympians with us uh, this evening. I'm going to call out their names, and uh, hopefully they'll stand and remain standing, if they can. Um, and then we can have an applause for them at the very end of things. Uh, first off, Candy Craig, 2008, 2012, 2016. <laughs> Margie Dingledine Martini. Margie travels with her own cheering section. Chris Norris, 1980-84. Kirk Everest, 1992-96. Basically, everybody named Fisher at this table. Eric, Aria, Mackenzie, please stand up. Uh, uh, let's stand up and, again, remain standing. Again, there, there are rules to this sort of thing. Come on. J.W. Krumpholz is in the house. Where's J.W. from 2008? And finally, Jamie Neuschel. Jamie. Uh, Now please, uh, please, ladies and gentlemen, a full round of applause for everybody. No, but before we do that, every single year, I've only been doing this 24 years, every single year we miss somebody. Someone who's an Olympian who snuck in the back door, didn't pay, but is still, <laughs> we won't judge, but if you were on an Olympic team and I didn't mention your name and you have paid full price for your ticket, will you please stand and let yourself, oh good, we didn't miss anybody this year. Ladies and gentlemen, our Olympians. Well, I can, I can retire now. We've gone through with it. Uh, and consistent with the, t with the theme of celebrating sport, celebrating all levels of sport, tonight we recognize future champions. There are a couple of high school teams with us that won their, their respective championships. We've got the SoCal CCS Open Division Girls Champions. I suspect you're down at this end, correct? There's nobody from SoCal. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, they said they were down at that end. Please rise, ladies and gentlemen, from SoCal. Thank you very much, congratulations. And also we have the De La Salle boys, the NCS Open Division. I have no idea where they are, so they just have to stand up on their own. There they are, thank you. We'll just have to fire the stage manager, that's all. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the keynote speaker and dinner will follow a little bit later. Thank you so much, bon appetit. Enjoy.
She scores! Yeah! Which one? Yellow? Yellow. Now blue? No, orange. Now blue. Water polo rolling right along. Our program has gotten underway. You heard from the MC Chris Storrs. The room here now they're breaking for dinner. And we're going to welcome in one of our finalists here momentarily, Nikolaus Papa Nikolaus. Before we get to Big Papa, we hear from Tilly Kern. She's the one finalist who couldn't be here. We get it, Australia. It's a long flight. Tilly, if you're watching, hello. Thanks for sending this video in. Let's hear Tilly's thoughts on what it means to be a finalist. Firstly, I just wanted to apologize for the setup. Um, I'm sorry I couldn't be there tonight, but I'm back home in Sydney, Australia, uh, in my family home, in my bedroom. Um, but yeah, thank you for letting me still be a part of it. I was asked what it would mean to win the Catino Award, and the Peter J. Catino Award is obviously one of the highest honors there is in our sport. I remember as a freshman, Amanda Longin won the Catino, and as an Aussie, I didn't really know what it was, so I looked into it, I did some research. I was okay as a freshman, but the Catino was never in the realm of possibility for me, so I looked it up and I thought it was cool and I thought Amanda was epic and I still do. But yeah, it was never a goal of mine, um, never even crossed my mind really. So it's been a couple of years since then and I'm genuinely stoked to be up here, virtually even, among some of the best in the game at the moment. The award would represent how far I've come from being that freshman Tilly. Um, which is a testament to the USC program. They developed me tremendously and I'm forever grateful for that. Also to the players around me that just pushed me day in and day out and made me become a much better player. We wanted to win the Natty, obviously, but we couldn't get that. So I'd love to just be able to represent my Trojan family, my real family and my country, um, and also that pretty freshman, that pretty average freshman. Um, by winning this award, so it, it would mean the world, but I just am stoked to be up here, so thank you. Big thanks to Tilly Kearns for sending in her thoughts, hope she's doing well in Australia. Now we're joined by another one of our finalists here in the room, the reigning Catino Award winner, Nikolaus Papa Nikolaou. Couldn't be here last year, thrilled you're here this year, thanks for being here. Yeah, it's great to be here, it's an, it's an amazing event, event already. Uh, we got to talk about the season that transpired last fall into December. You've had a few months to kind of digest what went down in December. Let's go back to Berkeley, that national championship game. When you think back on that day, what comes to mind? Uh, to, to be perfectly honest, uh, everything is, uh, is blurry from that night, especially entering the fourth quarter. Like, I, I, I don't remember, like, Anything. I don't remember what I was thinking um, after I was just thinking of each possession like uh, separately right you know we're going to offense we have to score we're going to defense we have to you know have a good, good block so we have uh, some time you know because we're down like four goals yeah. 
So that's uh, that's we we had to stay you know remain confident in our team and it, it was very difficult and it was like me and my other teammates we we all have the same like uh, we all remember it the same remember it the same way like it was very blurry because everybody was focused in the moment and that's great and it's it's great that you have a team that's focused in the moment every moment to play for their team and uh, you know win end up winning a game like that you you put together a game that goes down as one of the greatest individual performances ever in an NCAA final. When you're scoring that many goals, and I know a lot of them came late, are you aware of how many goals you have? What's your thought process on offense? I, ha I had no idea. Uh, I had no idea how many goals I had. I think uh, I finished, w when the game ended, I thought I had three or four, to be honest. Really? Yeah. and. Uh, I just went to a couple of interviews and when they told me, I was like as shocked as uh, Jack Dilly. <laughs> I was like, oh, like I, I completely like, you know, blacked out. I forgot all about the beginning of the game. And, you know, I was just, it, it's like a testament of, uh, you know, how focused I was towards the, the last five, six minutes of the game. The goal that I think stands out for a lot of people is that tip in in front of the goal where you kind of just kept working and you're able to find the rebound and punch it in. Where does... It's a tough job you have to play two meters. You have to be exhausted. Where, yeah. where does the the extra energy come to stick with that play and finish it? I feel, I feel it was uh, you know adrenaline at this moment. It was 12:9. I kind of in my head I knew that you know we have to do something right now. We were running out of time, and I guess it has to do a lot of uh, a lot with practice, as I've talked about. You know, it's it is uh, indeed something. It was indeed something we were working every day I practice with uh, with Zach and to be honest I had tried this shot a couple of times before during the year and it didn't work out yeah so that was kind of a kind of a joke something that you know Zach was like hey I'm passing you the ball so great like can you score like yeah. <laughs> you know as a more like a, as a joke uh, yeah. but yeah it's it's I guess when you're doing it every day and I was I was I was really tired I'm not gonna lie I was uh, I was <laughs> exhausted and I think it's all about the adrenaline. At the moment, I was I couldn't think about being tired. I've talked to your coach before, Kirk Evers. He said one of the things that sets you apart as a center is that you're in such good shape that you can swim for four quarters. A lot of centers can't, right? They have to sub out. He said one of the challenges with your team is is to get time for Avaki and Jordy because you could go the whole game. How do you get yourself in that level of fitness? I guess it's a... I've come like the last uh, two, three years. Uh, I, I, I really like. I don't really like, but I've, I'm okay with swimming. I practice. Uh, I'm very competitive, so I practice every day. We have some very fast swimmers like Garrett Dan, Jake Stone. They're so fast. I, I can't possibly compete with them, but I, I'm trying. So I guess it's it's because everybody's working hard during preparation. Uh, in my, I have a mindset that I have to follow them. I have to go as fast as I can, and that's that's a result. It's a result of uh, a lot of practice and uh, a lot of competitiveness uh, inside the team. We almost had a water polo player say they like swimming here, but you had to back off. I mean, you know. Yeah, no, 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 no. no I, can, I, can, I can't say that. I'm done. <laughs> so let's, let's let's go back to that fourth quarter. You've played enough water polo to know that if you're down four with about seven minutes to go, you shouldn't win the game. If you were winning by four with seven minutes to go, I bet you would tell me that 100% of the time you should win that game. Yeah. I know it's a little blurry in memory. How did you do it? How did how'd your team stay in it and win it? It's, I, I literally remember the timeout. We had uh, Kerry called the timeout. I think, I think there were like six minutes left, around six minutes left. And we're down 12-8. And uh, we're looking at the score. And I remember it was me and Dilly was right next to me. And, we're looking at the score and we know, we've been playing water polo enough to know that uh, that's a very difficult lead uh, to come back from. Um, you know, it's, you just try to remain positive, but it's, it's really difficult, especially at this level, right? It's very, very rare that something like this happened. But I have to, you know, it's, it's all about, our team was like, we switched, uh, it was like a, we turned on a switch. Yeah. Like, it wasn't the offensive part, okay, or well, the offensive part, you know, I had like, I felt like, I was, I was lucky, lucky enough to be like, especially at the 12-12 goal. I was lucky enough to be there and just tip it in. Yeah. And uh, but I think the the most important thing wasn't the offense, was defense. 100%. I 
Like if you watch the whole game, we couldn't stop them. Like they could score very, very easily relatively to what we have been doing the whole year. Uh, so I, I guess it was a, an effort, a defensive effort from all of our team. Adrian had an amazing fourth quarter. Yeah. He proved that he, he is the best goalie uh, in college water polo. And he, he played like I know him. Like in practice, I can't score on him. Nobody can. <laughs> uh, and uh, the defense worked like so well. So I guess, I guess it, was, uh, it was a result of a team that has a winning culture. Right? We, 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 we love being a part of a team and eight, nine guys are coming back for their extra season of eligibility next year and that shows how much, how much, uh, how close this team is. Like even people who don't get that many minutes, they want to come back and be, be a part of a team and I think that was it. That was just the, the winning culture that we have developed in Berkeley. When you're chipping away at that four goal deficit, is there a moment where you think, even if you're losing still, is there a moment where everyone thinks like, wait a minute, like, we can do this? Yeah, to be honest, when I, when I scored a 12-11 yeah. from the post, yeah. uh, I, I thought to myself, we're close. But to be honest, I was so tired that I, 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 didn't, I didn't trust my, myself that I could keep on going. Like, yeah. I was considering asking for a sub because I was trying to find my breath. But when I scored a 12-12, uh, I've, seen, I've seen the video a couple of times. I, I, I kind of smiled. In my, in my head, it was like we won. When I scored a 12-12, the tip, it was, Luck was involved there too. So I'm like, okay, Luck is uh, in our favor. So th this was the moment where I'm like, we did it. Even if we were not there yet, but something in me was like, yeah, we've done it. To win this award last year, to be a finalist this year, what's, what's the response been from your friends and family? Oh yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's been great. My my parents uh, are really really loving it, and they're so they're so sad uh, that they can't be here to watch it in person. Uh, but uh, you know, just finishing the you know the NCAA final, right? And I go back to my locker, we're celebrating, and just pick up my phone and I see all those messages from my family. I know they're with me, and for sure uh, the award uh, it makes them it makes them a little bit emotional. Um, because uh, they're, they're really proud of me, but there's, there's a bittersweet because they can't be uh, here. My parents can't be here, my sister is here. Uh, fortunately, she was able to come from Greece, but it's kind of bittersweet. They're, they're obviously very proud and they, they, they love watching me succeed. I know you have another season still with Cal, but when you think about your family, right, and you make this big, and I think we talked about this last year, but you make this big move to come to the US, to go to college, and. You're checking all those boxes, right? You're yeah. winning national titles, you're winning player of the year, you're doing the thing academically. That has to just make them obviously sad to miss you, but so proud. Yeah, yeah, so proud. Uh, at the beginning, of course, it was very difficult to, to leave home. Uh, and I, I remember my mom was a little bit more upset. So, uh, she wasn't sure if I was the right move. Uh, but for sure now, she, she knows I made the right choice. and. Uh, She's, she's, she's so very proud of me and she doesn't, uh, she doesn't miss any chance to, to tell me that, uh, you know, and I don't really tell her, but, you know, I really appreciate, appreciate her and, uh, you know, I love her. That's great. Right. Well, hopefully if they get a chance to watch this, they've, they've heard those thoughts. Cal has won two titles in a row, but it's Cal, so you're supposed to do it again in the fall. How do you handle the expectations of you're supposed to be great every time out? I feel like it's the same as uh, last year, you know, last summer. We felt like we have, as I told you before, I f we felt like we have, uh, we had a, the tar a target on our box, uh, and we handled it uh, perfectly. We might have been down like uh, we, we only had like two losses in the season, which is which is pretty good for a program. And um, I guess uh, we have managed to maintain that culture even after Nikos de la Gramarica's left, yeah. who was uh, who we have talked about it in the team, and he was the he was the main leader who started the whole like. Uh, winning culture, right? And we we we're so glad we, with uh, captains uh, like Jack Dilly, Marco Valles, we we're able to maintain that winning culture, and we are gonna try and keep on doing it. Like me, uh, Adrian, and uh, Garrett, and all those other leaders, because we have like eight, nine seniors coming in. We we are you know focused, dedicated to do it again, and I feel like we we all want it the same. Uh, a three pit. We, last time we, did, we had the three peat the program had a three peat uh, I remember the exact date. It was 80, 89? I'm not, I'm not sure. Might have been the Kirk, Kirk Evers time. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
So it's it's a big thing, and it's it's definitely something to look look forward to, and it's something we're gonna work really hard during the summer to be ready to, you know, win another championship. How do you feel about the nickname Big Papa? Uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure about that. Uh, I, I like the song though. I, was I like I like I like the, the video, the video, the yeah. USA Water Polo. I like the video. Uh, but did you, you know, write that song before? Because it was funny when you I, start scoring all these goals. Everyone starts immediately tweeting, I love it when you call me Big Papa. <laughs> and I thought initially, why didn't I think of that? But it's kind of taken off. I, f I, feel, like, I feel like, you know, uh, the nickname Papa is new yeah. to me. Uh, they just developed it here when I came to the U.S. because we had another Nikos, so they yeah. couldn't call me by my first name. Yeah. So it's kind of new, obviously, now I'm kind of used to it. But yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty cool, but <laughs> I, I don't know how I, feel, how I really feel about Big Papa. Like, I like Papa, but I'm not, I'm not sure. I like the song, too. I have some bad news for you. I think you should brace yourself because uh. I feel like you're going to hear a whole lot of Big Papa this uh. fall in Berkeley. <laughs> I guess I have to deal yeah. with it. <laughs> hey, well, thanks for the time. Yeah, thank you so Appreciate much. Appreciate being here. Good luck tonight. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Have a good All one. All right, Nicholas Papa Nicolau joining us here. Oh, you gotta get your microphone. Oh. Hang on a sec. Yep. We'll take that from you. I got it. All good. We continue right along here during our Catino Award live show. We'll take another timeout. We'll come back. More finalists. They're here in the room. Five out of six have shown up here this year in San Francisco. An awesome turnout as we work our way to finding out who is the best in the world of college water polo. One man, one woman will be honored here tonight. We'll take a timeout and return after this. time to become a water polo referee. The sport continues to grow nationwide and refs are a vital part of that expansion. Join today. Whether you played for years or are new to the sport, all are welcome. Stay active with flexible hours while making extra money with competitive rates nationwide. Build a network of new friends that will last a lifetime, all while making a positive impact on youth sports. Make a difference in water polo. Become a referee today. Visit usawaterpolo.org slash referee to learn more. Aria Fisher is here. How are you? Great. It's great to be here. I'm excited to be here. Just a couple of weeks ago, celebrating in Stockton, we had Ryan Neuschel on earlier. It's only been a few weeks, but yeah. what, what stands out to you about that final match? I think just the number of people we had contribute in that game. You know, we had Celeste, uh, one of our defenders, yeah. who came out and scored two early goals in the first quarter. And I think from that point, everyone was just super excited to be there, super confident in our preparation. And yeah, we had contributions across the board. And uh, that was, you know, it's always a fun game to play when you have everyone doing, doing stuff. I asked Ryan the same thing, and you know, I'm curious for your take, but the scouting report, I'd imagine for USC, had you on it and Ryan and some others. What is it about the Stanford team that in the biggest game, someone like Celeste was confident, someone like Ella was confident to deliver? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think JT does a great job at preparation, and he does a great job at making sure everyone knows that their role is vital. Uh, but not only that, that you're going to have to step up in the big games. And you never know who it'll come from, but you got to be ready for your moment. And so I think JT does a great job at, like, uh, uh, team cohesion and chemistry that really, like, creates those, that space for anyone to step up in any moment. How about your journey with Stanford and then this last year really being 
not just this year, right, but in the last couple of years being looked at as a leader on this team. What's that been like for you? And I was thinking of one specific moment. You play center, right? You take a beating in that in that position often. There was a physical altercation late in that game, and you were the one telling everyone, hey, calm down, yeah. relax. Yeah. Where where'd that come for you to, to be that emotional leader for the group? Yeah, obviously I'm a little bit older <laughs> than the other girls, so I definitely played in a lot of, I guess, games like that that get physical. And so just learning, learning from like those years of playing in those games, and I think uh, for me it was really, it was really great. This team, like I said, the chemistry was great, the cohesion was great. It was really easy to be a leader, um, and just to kind of, uh, there was so much trust, I think, amongst everyone, amongst the veterans, amongst the younger people, that there was room for everyone to kind of lead by example and everyone to, to kind of look at each other and, and be like, hey, we're okay, we got this. And, uh, so yeah, that was kind of what it was. I know she's here tonight, but what was it like to, to not be playing with Mackenzie? Yeah. Um, honestly, it was something going into the year I was really sad about. I love playing with Mackenzie. She's obviously one of the best players to ever have played the game, so it's nice to have you with her on your team. Uh, There's definitely big shoes to fill for our team this year, and also I just like having her around because we're really close. So it, it was tough, but she's living a very happy retired life, <laughs> life now, and I'm now joining her on that, so um, it's, it's nice. This is obviously not the last time you're allowed to be around water polo, but have you thought more about kind of the end of this chapter for you and all the time you've spent with this sport? Yeah, um, obviously it's yeah, it's been quite a journey through the sport, and I'm so glad I ended it with Stanford. It really feels like a family there. JT uh, has felt like a family as a coach for like the last six years, and Susan, and they just do a great job at making it a home, making Stanford a home. So I was really happy to end my career in that environment. And obviously going out with a win was really nice. Um, yeah, so it's a nice way to end my, my ch that little chapter of my life. You described yourself as one of the older girls before, but yeah. you're, not, you're not old in the grand scheme of things. But you accomplished all of these things. Almost like a rocket ship took off in 2015. From then until now, I mean, how do you process what, what you were able to do in that time span. It's its really ridiculous. I mean, I know you lived it, but, and, and, and I say that with admiration, right? It's like impressively ridiculous yeah, yeah. if you look at all of that. Yeah. When you think back on that, how, how do you kind of process all of that? It's hard. I think yeah. it's something I'm still processing, yeah. for sure. But, um, I mean, I think, honestly, with gratitude, um, I think there, there's no way that happens without a bunch of people supporting me. Um, and I think, like, first things that comes to mind is my family, Mackenzie and my parents, and them being willing to support me at a young age on that water polo journey, and also my teammates that I've had throughout the years that have just, uh, like, the older girls on the national team when I was, like, 15, 16, and, like, showing me how to be a leader so that I could be a leader in these last, you know, few months with the Stanford team. And so, yeah, I think, like, just the people around me, um, it just makes me really grateful for like how my journey turned out thus far. You know, I'm glad you brought that up, right? You think back to that first Olympic team, you you hold the distinction, I think, of being the youngest ever woman on a Team USA team yeah. sport, right? When it comes to Olympic Games, what what did you learn in that year from when you were trying to make a roster to then you were an Olympian, really in the span of about 18 months? Yeah. What'd you take from that? to then share with younger girls this this year at Stanford? Yeah, I think a lot of leadership skills. Um, uh, a lot of just like how you show up at pool at the pool every day and work hard and what, what it takes to, to be a championship team and, and what it takes to be a leader of a championship team. I think I learned that from all those girls, you know, from Maggie, from Cami, all those girls, um, I mean, everyone, Mel, Courtney, like all those girls who were older during that year, I think just like looking around and looking at how different they were, but how much of leaders they were in their own way, I think it was gave you space to kind of grow into your own as a player and as a leader. So that was helpful. Every time I talk to JT before a game or a season, and I'm always coming at it from the sports standpoint of who's going to play what position, who scored this or that. He kind of always doesn't start with that. He wants to start with what you're doing academically or what's happening yeah. community-based. Or let me tell you about this great author we met or we took the, the team to go meet a professor. Yeah. How has the Stanford experience kind of 
rounded the edges of the water polo experience for you? Yeah, I mean, it, it was everything. I think water, well, water polo provided the opportunity for me to go to Stanford, and then JT really, really pushes you to pursue your passions and to grow in multiple ways. Like, even public speaking, like, he makes us do TED Talks over winter break and spring break, and when you're a freshman, you're like, come on, like, <laughs> I want to go lay in the sun and, like, not think about, like, school or work, and... Uh, but then this last year, I was like actually really appreciated those things and like loved the TED Talks and getting to know what my teammates were passionate about and getting to share my passions with them. So I think it's something that you definitely learn to appreciate as you get older under JT and his coaching. Now, you mentioned your family and, and some of your parents. I think I've seen them at every pool on earth, <laughs> yeah. right, to watch you play water polo. Yeah. Some would say, well, it was predestined that you and Mackenzie would do it. Your dad played at such a high level. Your mom, no stranger to the sport. But I know they were not pushing you into it, right? Your dad was very clear you're going to be good swimmers before you're going to play, play water polo. Yeah. Turns out you ended up in the sport anyway. Yeah. What, what have they meant in the big picture to what you and your sister have accomplished? I mean, they're everything, I think, to, to our accomplishments. I mean, my dad was my first coach. Yeah which always surprises people, but he was my coach up until the point I was in high school, essentially, so from like eight to 14. And he's still like one of the best coaches I know of, just of fundamentals. So many girls came out of that program and went to great colleges. Um, and obviously because of Ethan D'Amato as well, sure. Beach High School, a lot of yeah. people, a lot of people related to that. But, um, and my mom, like just super selfless and, and dri driving me everywhere, driving me to national team practices at night when I wear like my headlamp in the back <laughs> doing my homework and get made fun of when I got there, but like driving me at all hours. Uh, probably the only one who thought I was going to make the 2016 Olympic team was my mom, other than me. Yeah. Everyone else probably thought I was like a little unrealistic and my mom had full faith in me the whole time. So I think, I mean, I am... I there's I can't thank them enough for the support that they provided me throughout the years. And then to to be up for an honor like this, how is this a reflection of of the Stanford team? Yeah, I mean, I think I already spoke about JT and and Susan and Kim and Kyle who are all here, but I think I mean it really speaks to them how many um, Stanford Coutinho nominees they've had um, in the past uh, in their actually the whole time they've been coaching at Stanford, and I think. They really curate an environment where individuals can be successful, and then my teammates are so supportive. Um, you know, I, I just—it's almost—I don't have the words, honestly, to like describe how many people um, like make something like this happen, and how grateful I am to that for that. But it, it's great to be here. It's great that Ryan was also nominated. Yeah. Um, I'm glad we were both nominated together, and we won. Right. She said she's rooting for you, by the way. So oh, my God. She, I'm rooting for her. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Last thing I want to ask you about is, yeah. is, is the idea of winning, right? Yeah. Everywhere you've gone, yeah. high school, Stanford, national team, you probably in your life have like under 30 losses, if I had to guess. It's it's probably somewhere in there. What, what's what been the, the joy of that away from medals and trophies? If you think about all the victories you've shared with teammates from the very first... Laguna team yeah. to now. What 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 memories will you take from all that aside from a trophy or a medal? Right. I think it's unique to every team really and every experience. But when I look back on my water polo career, yeah, I remember the wins, but I really remember the the memories of teammates. And everyone says that, but it, it really is true. You remember the tough times showing up early morning practices in high school, like five AM before school, jumping into a cold pool. You remember all the like the weird travel stories that went wrong and bonding with teammates through that way and, and I think really the bond with the people and the memories are the things that you take from those experiences the most. Good stuff. Aria, thanks for being here. Good thank luck tonight and uh, perhaps we'll talk to you later. Yeah, thank you. Okay, take care. Aria Fisher joining us here at the Gatino Awards. We'll take a timeout and return with more. Score. Lola, we need you. Get in there. But wait, coach.
Kerforian has just subbed in their secret weapon, Lola the dog. She shoots. She scores! Yeah! Which one? Yellow? Yellow. Now blue? No, orange. Now blue. We're back here live at the Olympic Club in San Francisco with our final finalist of the night, Real D'Souza. Real, thanks for being here. Of course, thank you. Thanks, pleasure. So, a lot of hype, of course, around guys from Cal and USC. They made the final. Great opportunity for Pacific to get some love here. You're a finalist. What was your reaction when you heard that you're one of the three here to be honored tonight? Uh, you know, Greg, it was a very surreal feeling for sure. Um, you know, one of the beauty. Like beautiful things about UOP is like the, the team chemistry, the cohesiveness, you know, and um, I got a lot of my brothers that helped me be in the position I am today and the season that we had, you know, ultimately we fell short of our goal, but it's uh, the team that, that put me in the position that I am today. So. To be a sophomore, coming off your sophomore season, 54 goals, Pacific right there to try and make the NCAAs, how does that line up with your expectations for the season? Um, of course, like the expectation for us was to win the ring. So, uh, like I said, we came short. Uh, for me, it wasn't so much about uh, my individual performance. Uh, as long as my performance was enough to help us get wins, that's what I was looking for. So, uh, you know, we played a, a really good Cal team, and obviously, respect and congratulations to Cal for the amazing season, and Jake and Nikos for their nominations as well. But, you know, we, we played Cal first game of the season, we fell short in OT. We played them again in the semifinal, fell short again, so unfortunately things didn't go our way, but yeah, I mean, success of the season was dependent on how we did as a team. Yeah. How do you build off of this year for next season? Oh, I mean, there's a lot of room to jump off. I think uh, we have a really great group of guys. Uh, the starting group that we had this year all the way down to the 30th man. You know, we had 37 guys part of the program, staff included. and. Um, I can honestly say that every single guy contributed in their own way, and um, I'm just I'm really proud to be a part of what we have there, and I, I think there's a lot of room to grow. A uh, change in conference is coming in, yeah. in men's college water polo, Big West starting, but also the West Coast Conference, where Pacific is for other sports. How does that change things for your team at all? Uh, you know, the WCC is obviously going to be a competitive conference. Um, we have some of the same conference opponents that we had in the GCC, yep. so there are some similarities, some differences. Um, I think it definitely puts us in a good position. I think uh, our record against most of our opponents that are going to be in the WCC is fairly good, fairly strong. So I like uh, I like our chances going into the next season and beyond. You look at University of the Pacific, and I love the Twitter handle, Water Polo U, right? Yeah. There's a lot of pride in Water Polo. We saw it with the women's NCAAs. People turn out, the crowd show out. How do you describe the environment for a Pacific home game? I feel like every time I see a video or I've been to Stockton, the place is packed, they're going nuts. What's it like as a player? You know, Greg, I've played water polo a long time, <laughs> and playing in Stockton is its something that's hard to put into words. Like, 
I, I found a joy for water polo that, you know, I thought I loved water polo, and then I came to Stockton and I found like an even more, I don't know, it was it was amazing. You know, the, the fans, the student section, are, are all of our supporters playing Stockton, is it's a dream for us and a nightmare for a lot of other people. <laughs> That's exactly right. That's yeah. exactly right. So this specific team, James Graham, so often assembles guys from not only around the country but around the globe, right? It's talent from all over, international, from around the U.S. What is it like to get that whole group to come together as one when people have had different playing styles, different national teams, different clubs? How do you guys gel as a group? Honestly, that's a great question. And uh, at first, when I first arrived there, I thought that was going to be a fault of ours, a weakness. You know, like you're trying to mesh so many different styles of play together, and um, in the end, it becomes a, a big strength of ours. I think uh, we find a lot of common ground in water polo. It's a universal language. You know, uh, we had guys from kind of all over the globe. I'm fortunate to have two of my brothers from from uh, from Canada as well, Jeremy and Bogdan. Guys I've grown up with, guys that I love. I know I've played with them for years and. We, we all bring something special. I think we all bring something unique. And when you put it all together and you put a lot of hours in together, uh, you, know, you just see it out there in the pool, but it's something special for sure, something unique. What's been the response of those guys to finding out that you're a finalist here, guys that you've known for the longest time? Uh, they were ecstatic for me. You know, um, I live with Jeremy and Bogdan. And um, like I said, guys that I've grown up with, guys that I consider my brothers. and. Uh, their reaction made my reaction. You know, I was just I was ecstatic to see that they were as happy for me as I was. I was just happy to represent us, the program, and yeah, like their their reactions. Mihailo, Jole, everybody. You know, one through thirty-eight. Like I said, it's just the reception I got from my teammates is what made it special for me. It's not so much sure. being here. You know. Now your brother is in water polo, right? He played yeah. coaching at Arizona State. Yeah. What impact has he had on your water polo life? Man, so much. Uh, really, like, me and Ethan have been in this since the start, you know, like, getting to where we are today. I think um, his reaction to this whole thing probably was what made my, my whole night today, I think. Like, he was one of my first coaches. Uh, he was my coach through under 18s almost. And, he also coached on the junior national team as an assistant while I was on the national team. I was the captain of the junior team, and ah, man, I, that guy means the world to me. I don't know how else to say it. Yeah. Like, he's been with me every step of the way. When I, when my head falls down a little bit, he's always there to knock it back up. Or if my head's too high, he'll be the first one to knock it down. <laughs> I love it. He keeps you even keel. That's the way. Uh, you've obviously spent time with the Canadian national team. Where, where do you stand now with the national team? Are you are you going back to training soon, or what's your involvement there? Yeah, so I'll, I'll be redshirting next season uh, for preparation for the Olympic Games, uh, Pan American Games in November. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm on the next flight to Montreal tomorrow. Okay, yeah. all right. And so tell me a little bit about Team Team Canada. What's what's their prospects here? I know, obviously, every team is thinking qualification for uh -huh. Paris, Pan Ams in Chile coming up uh, this fall. What else is ahead for the Canadian squad? You know, hopefully big things. I think uh, we have a good group of really good guys. Um, I think a lot of the strength of the Canadian national team is similar to UOP. It's a, it's a brotherhood, you know, it's um, guys that have grown up together. I've known most of my teammates on the national team since I was under 12, under 14, you know, somewhere around there. I hope big things, you know. I think uh, the beauty of sport, and you see it all the time, you know, NBA finals, whatnot. Um, culture, cohesiveness, you know, it's not always uh, star power that gets it done, it's how well do you connect and play with the people around you, and the brothers around you, you know. You talked a little bit about your brother, of course, but your family in general, mm -hmm. I'm not sure if some are watching, if some are here, what, what message do you have for them and what they've meant to you and where you've gotten water polo? Oh, man. First off, I want to say shout out mom, dad, I love you, Shanara and Ethan, love you guys. Uh, if it wasn't for my mom, the three of us would not be in the position we are today. You know, I, I moved to Canada when I was young, when I was uh, just entering kindergarten, so four or five. Um, my parents don't know how to swim, and we liked splashing around when we were kids. So when we first moved to Canada, my mom wanted to find a way for us to meet people, you know, um, make friends, get kind of immersed in the culture. And we were always going to the swimming pool. Like, we were just splashing around, going in the little 
you know, just just having a fun, like having a blast. And my mom saw a little poster for the local club there. It was a recreational team, but when we got there together, my brothers were the age to start, but I was really young. I was, like I said, five or six yeah. when I wanted to get in the pool, and they made an exception because my two brothers were there, and we got in the water and we never looked back. And if it wasn't for my mom, we would not be here. That's fantastic. Parents, right? They they end up being being the ones that help get you to where you want to go. Yeah, and they're the, the the first ones to cheer you on when you're in the water. Ruel, thanks for being here, man. Appreciate it. It's a pleasure, Greg. Congrats on being a finalist, and hopefully we'll talk to you down the road. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. All right, Ruel D'Souza joining us here from the Catino Awards. We'll take a time out and come back with more. Time's running out. They need to score. Lola, we need you. Get in there. But wait, Coach Kerforian has just subbed in their secret weapon. Lola the dog. She shoots. She scores! Yeah! There's no better time to become a water polo referee. The sport continues to grow nationwide and refs are a vital part of that expansion. Join today. Whether you played for years or are new to the sport, all are welcome. Stay active with flexible hours while making extra money with competitive rates nationwide. Build a network of new friends that will last a lifetime, all while making a positive impact on youth sports. Make a difference in water polo. Become a referee today. Visit usawaterpolo.org referee to learn more. one yellow yellow now blue no orange now blue Welcome back here, Olympic Club in San Francisco. Greg Messler here with you, joined with the Cal head coach, Kirk Everest. Kirk, thanks for being here. Welcome, thank you. Again, a Cal Bear, a finalist. Papa won it last year, he's back again. How do you describe what this guy's doing right now in college water polo? He's on quite a tear. Yeah, I mean, tremendous athlete. You know, works super hard. Um, one of those guys that you just love coaching, you know. 
tremendously talented, um, can do a lot of different things in the pool. So versatile, can play on the perimeter as we saw in the championship game, scored an outside shot. Yeah, obviously is a center by trade. Uh, if need, he can guard two meters. You know, he's not left-handed, he's not a goalie, but other than that, he, he can do everything else. We talked in Berkeley right after that championship game. You've, you've had a few months to kind of marinate on what transpired on that day. When you think back on that final, what comes to mind? Resiliency, I think that team was, I've told this group, you know, they kind of came in during COVID. Um, they stayed together. They all came to, to campus when there was no campus available. They figured out ways. They, I think there's still a cage uh, at the Dolphin Club underneath a dock that they took from Cal and went out there and they would just jump in the water yeah. and train together. Um, they've created a culture that, you know, that travels. And, um, and so they're hard to beat and they don't panic and they just keep grinding and they have a belief in themselves um, and they've integrate they integrate players really easily um, and so you know all of that kind of came to fruition in that game where they had a lot of adversity and they had to you know stay together and to give themselves a chance because if they splintered if they tried to do it themselves a player like nikos who can do it all by himself if he tries to do it it's not going to work yeah if he just stays the course and and plays and lets his teammates around him play we got a shot and that's the the beauty of this group you've watched enough water polo you've played enough to know that a game like that final you're not supposed to win i mean if there was an espn win probability in the yeah, fourth we were quarter, down at two percent it would maybe. have been i mean maybe less down four with what six six seven minutes to go you talked about the resiliency. I asked Papa this question. At one point in that battle back when you're chipping away, does it start to go from, I hope we can do this, to I think we can do this? When it happened for you? I think when we you? scored, and I'm not sure, again, thinking back, when we got within two was the first time I actually heard the crowd. Okay. And SC did an incredible job of just stymieing us and we couldn't get momentum, we couldn't get the crowd into it. Um, there was, we didn't feel it. And when we got within two, it was louder than I think I've ever heard it at that place. <laughs> yeah. And and so at that point, I'm like, I think, you know, we're, we're getting in their heads a little bit. We got a shot. And we had enough time uh, to, to make it happen, but um, I think that was the moment where I really looked and went, all right, we got a shot. It's it's funny momentum, right? I don't think you even have to be playing or coaching to feel it. And I think back to that final sequence, the save and the Valera goal. I've watched that video probably a thousand times, like I'm sure you and many Cal fans have. When he gets out on that break, as I think back on it in the moment, calling that game, it felt inevitable that it was going in. The momentum felt like a giant boulder rolling downhill. That's just that's just my stance, and I say it all the time. I, I don't I don't care who wins, right? Let's just see a good game. Did it feel that way to you? Did it feel like this is just happening? Yeah, I mean, I think a little bit. I mean, obviously, they have so many talented players. When you're down that many goals, you kind of, you're looking, trying to figure out how you're going to try to do it. And you've got to make stops. you got to score, but you got to make stops. And they've got so many great players. Yeah. Um, you know, and, uh, and so... You're kind of, if you really think about it, you're like, how, what are the chances we keep <laughs> Jake, Massimo, yeah. you know, off the scoreboard for four and a half, five minutes? Because that's what we have to do. We kind of have to have a, you know, a clean sheet for four minutes if we're going to really honestly do this. And, uh, but, and then they get a six on five at the end, which is kind of typical. You, you tie the game. It's going to happen. We're getting kicked out. Yep. Um, and, and so, opportunity, situation, ball goes in, you're out. So now we gotta play five man. Um, you know, looking back again, I still had to look a couple times, like how did we get? The one thing we didn't do well was counterattack. <laughs> and so how did we get behind the defense at the most critical point in a championship game? What happened? Yeah. And some of it was just the way they rotated and where they were and they were in trouble and a couple players kind of going, well, maybe I can get the ball 
and they couldn't, and now they've committed too many guys, and Roberto's gone. Yeah. Um, so, you know, took advantage of it, but you still got to score the ball, right? You got to check the mirrors, right? <laughs> Great call. Um, guys still yell that. Roberto gets off on a, on a counterattack in practice, and you'll hear guys, check the mirrors, right? Um, so it's, it's, that's going to go down in history for this, these boys. So. That's classic. I said this to Papa too, right? You win two in a row. The ex expectation of a place like Cal is, okay, three in a row now. There's history of, of three-peats in the past. How do you handle the expectations just continue? And that's the that's the hardest part, the most the biggest concern. You know, we're on a break right now. Um, we take a little bit longer break than probably everybody else, and we come back in July and we start double days, and these guys have some personal responsibility to it's not a break from training, I tell them it's a break from me. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. and so, you know, we'll see when we get back. Are they in shape and they're ready to go? Because if they're not, we're going to struggle because we don't have enough time. Um, so there's there's that maturity level. This team proved last year they could do it. They came back. They were all in good shape. We could start. And I didn't have to adjust things for them. Um, and that's my expectation now. Uh, and then mentally, I think they're ready to go. They're excited to be back. They want to they wanna be there as opposed to it's kind of the baton death march of, oh, God, I got to, you know, six weeks and then the season is kind of in sight. Um, so we've tried some different stuff uh, and and it goes to their maturity. Can they handle it? I think they can. I give them that trust um, and uh, we'll see. And I, I, I wait until I see them take <laughs> off their shirts and go, are they in shape or not? Yeah. Um, but I'm excited about it. We got a great team t returning. No matter what happens, it's all a huge collection of one goal games. You got to figure out how to win the one goal games. You got a guy like Papa, Max, Roberto, you know, um, I'll take my chances in a one goal game. Well, it, it, there's there's no bigger endorsement than so many of these guys coming back using extra years. Yeah, they yeah. they could move on. Sure. We had we have eight kids in this class that all had a COVID year and all eight of them are returning. Um, some of them were not on our final 16 for the, the NC2As last year. They're all coming back. Um, you know, they're going to compete for a spot. They want to be on that team. They have a shot at doing that. Um, but they love the program. They want to be around it. Um, they're willing to sacrifice. They, we talked a lot early on about what are you going to do academically to make it work that last year because it's real. You, you know. Stay in the ninth semester when you're a freshman sounds like no big deal. Yeah. When you're a, in your ninth semester and you got one class and it's kind of a whatever class just to you know to create units, it doesn't sound so cool anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And so we talked a lot about that. Nikos is getting, you know, Papa's getting a minor, you know, in data science. So he had that plan that I can do this, and so. I'm getting something out of that last semester that will allow me to feel good about myself academically and let's go play some polo. Papa said he doesn't love the nickname Big Papa. He's uncertain about it. He enjoys the music of Notorious yeah, yeah. B.I.G. He I told himself him, as Nikos. So I said, I think that train Papa. has left the station on Big Papa. I think yeah, yeah. from a social media standpoint, a lot of love to call him Big Papa. So that yeah, might yeah. just have stuck. I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe, maybe Thursday nights in Berkeley, Papa, Papa sounds better than Nikos, but if you ask him, he's going to say Nikos. You have been with this program a long time, not only as, as a former player, but now as head coach. You had those two titles in the mid-2000s, and then there were a number of years where you were there, but it was someone else winning sure. until you broke through in 2016. How challenging was it for you in those intervening years between titles to to stick with it and to, I'm sure people are saying, when are we going to win? When's Cal going to win again? Sure. We talked about expectations. How'd you stay in it and stay focused and not and not get down when the titles weren't coming? And not to make it like this isn't brain surgery, right? But this is your job. This is what you're yeah. what you're paid to do. Yeah, I mean, a place like Berkeley, there's a lot of expectations, and you uh, you know you struggle through those moments of what could you have done because it is it's a string of one goal games. Yeah. Look back at it. It's all. You know, woulda, coulda, shoulda. Yeah. Um, and and so 
you know, it's easy to, to, to get discouraged, to start questioning yourself. Um, you change things. You try to, I, I think even when you win, you start to look and go, all right, what can we do differently? What's the different thing that we can try to do to keep progressing, keep learning, have that kind of mindset that you're not complacent? Um, that's the concern of a team that's won two to try to win three. That's why it hasn't been done very often, yeah. right? Um, you know, we Cal's done it twice a long time ago, and USC did it. Yeah. Other than that, nobody else has done it. Yeah. Um, so that means it's hard. That means there were great teams. Our 2016 team took you know four overtimes to beat a UCLA team that was trying to do this. Yeah. And it's extremely difficult um, and so you're always just trying to you know it's it's a new year it's a new challenge um, you got to find a way to fight through and win one more one goal game than you lose and that gets you the shot at getting to the semifinal and then at that point you know let it ride but um, you know there's a lot of expectations at a Cal I played for Pete yeah. you know but I look you I I've, I've looked back at the trajectory. There were there were years where it, it didn't happen for Pete, and Pete was the standard. Still is, in my opinion. And there were times where, it, until he got, you know, there were teams that got it going, and then it kind of went for, you know, somebody else was Peaks winning. And valleys, yeah. And Dante took over, and, yeah. and whatever, or Newland, or, you know, and, and so, you know, you, you understand that reality. They're great teams, they're great talent, they're great coaches, and we're battling, and only one team can win. So if you get too caught up in that, it'll eat you alive. Um, the reality is the expectation, the pressure, that's a privilege. Uh, that's what we all want to be a part of. That's why I came back, to try to, to steward the ship somewhere where Pete and Steve had it, and you know, at some point, try to leave it in a in as good a place as when they had it, and that's my job. Um, and I take it seriously because I have a love for the program. Um, but it can be it, it can get into you a little bit. Um, but when you win, I'm no less. I'm more nervous now than I was, you know, five years ago, because there's expectations, and that's that's part of it. Like I expect them, I expect to win. I don't know, I wouldn't take another team, but these teams are really good. Yeah. So we're gonna have to claw it out of Pinta's hands or Flax or Graham or Gavin or, or, or you know, or, or Adam. Somebody's gonna be there at the end and they're not gonna, they're gonna try to get in our way. They're gonna do everything they can. It's gonna be the hardest year we've had in the three, I think. You know, it's funny because you kind of answer where I was, the second half of that question was, Given what you've been through, do you let yourself enjoy what's transpired over the last two seasons? Or is it constantly yeah, I, what's I, next? I don't know. I mean, I, I think perspective of doing it, I've been this 23 years or whatever. This will be our 23rd. I think the one thing I have done is allow myself to at least understand, like, what these guys have accomplished. Yeah. And, and that, you know, you've – my job is to, I think – is to find the environment that whatever the team I have, they operate the best in, and then try to create that environment. I, I'm malleable. I don't believe I'm the smartest guy in the room all the time. I want to look at what I got and try to change it a little bit to the personality of the team um, within the culture and the concept of how we'd like to play. Um, but. Yeah, you gotta you gotta enjoy the wins because they're they're hard, <laughs> and you work really hard for them. So enjoy them for the appropriate time. Yeah, and then we got to get back to work, and then understand the concept of again. I think this year will be the most challenging year for this group, sure, um, because of a number of mental, physical, just everybody's after you, and that's a privilege but it's going to be a massive challenge for this team um, and that's great that that makes your energy go up that that brings your pulse rate that's why you do it. Uh, I could be selling software um, it's not as fun as this 
Definitely not. No. Kirk Evers, thanks, man. I appreciate cool. it. Hey, it's good to catch you up. All right. We'll talk to you soon. All right. All right. Thank you. Let me just grab that mic from you. Oh, yeah. Kirk Evers joining us here at the Catino Awards. Thank you. Appreciate it. We roll right along. We're getting close to uh, dinner. I hear forks clanging. I don't know if dessert's coming or what's going on. I did not pick the menu. But I do know that we're getting closer to find out who will be our Catino Award winners here in 2023. We'll take a timeout. We'll come back with more from right here at the Olympic Club in San Francisco. Francisco, the Olympic Club, Greg Mesco here with you. Another member of the Fisher family, Mackenzie Fisher. Thanks for being here. Of course. I've talked to the catering staff. No peanut butter and jelly. I'm sorry. That's so good. it's a very inside joke. She, she, you, you post photos of them on your Instagram. I appreciate it. Every hike you go on, right? A PB and J is the move. Um, what's it like to be here in support of Aria? Um, it's awesome. I think she's had a great career, and so it's really nice to like have the cherry on the top, a little celebration for our whole family. Uh, we've been through a long journey in water polo. Water polo is a very big part of our lives, so it's nice to be here and be able to celebrate her career. She said that this year it was a little sad to not play with you. How is it for you to kind of watch your games? Yeah, it was really weird for me to be in the stands. It's definitely a, a bit more stressful in the stands than I think it is in the pool. Um, but it was really fun to watch her. It was fun to be in the stands with my parents. Um, but definitely stressful, and I wish I was in the pool with her. Yeah, did you like find yourself trying to like coach her or yell things out? What, what was your, your experience as a fan? Um, my experience as a fan was uh, <laughs> being like, watch the two posts, watch the two posts, watch the two posts. <laughs> I told you that the two posts was going to be open. That was literally like the whole time I was like, please put some on the two posts. Um, but yeah, I was definitely critiquing, but it's so much easier to critique outside the water than it is in. So. Uh, her maturation as a player, I was talking to her about this, and you you lived a similar journey of where you guys just did all the things. You, you won in high school, you won in college, you won with the Olympics. 
but to kind of step back and watch her path, she had in some respects to follow in your footsteps. How, how impressive is it to see what she did on her own? Oh, she is, I think she's one of the most impressive water polo players. I mean, I think we kind of joke about it, but her making that 2016 team as like, she came into the year like this tiny little, I don't know, what, like senior in high school, who was supposed to be a center against some of the meanest, toughest girls in the, in the world. And she just did it with like so much grit and determination. And I've always admired her for that. And I think, I mean, we joke about it, but none of us thought that she was going to make that 2016. She was the only person that believed in herself. And I think you can see that in the way that she plays, like with fire and passion. Um, and I've always admired that about her. Well, in the work she put in, you know, and some feel it's, it's uh, inappropriate to talk about a woman's weight, but Aria put on like 40, 50 pounds of muscle yeah. in the span of a year to be able to battle with everyone. That takes a next level work ethic. Yes. Oh uh, yeah. It was like really cute when she thought that she was going to be a center and she was like 120 pounds <laughs> and like a strength bean. Um, but yeah, like she always believed in herself and I think that our whole family has learned over time that like she can do pretty much anything and, and she's proved that time and time again. I was talking to her about a play during the championship game, and you and her very different players, very different demeanors in the water. Yes. As she noted, being one of the older girls on the team, I think gave her some perspective and some maturity, but there was a play late in that game, it was a physical confrontation, and she's the one telling everyone, calm down. Yes. Now, there's an aria a couple of years ago that might have been drawn into that a little bit further. What, what sort of growth did she have as a water polo player, not just from a skill standpoint, but from an emotional leadership standpoint? Yeah, I think she took to like a huge leadership role in the team and she led the team with grace. And I think, especially in that moment, it's so easy to get hot-headed. Um, and I think that, I mean, it's a tactic too. She knows yeah. like people are gonna try to get her out of her game and she, and she knew that going into the game and she was able to like, coolly and calmly navigate that situation and I was so proud of her on the side line but yeah no I think she showed great leadership throughout the year and um, she's always been someone that leads through action and I think that was like a perfect example of that. She talked about this but you mentioned your parents being here tonight and they've obviously been to so many of your games all over the world how do you describe their impact on your career and her career? Yeah I mean our parents have been instrumental my my mom is like our biggest fan and advocate and I it was so fun uh, slash stressful to watch with her in the stands because she was just so stressed about Aria but it's because she loves and cares for us so much and she's always you know she drove us to like an insane number of practices I remember we practice at UCLA and she would drive us like three hours in traffic at 3 p.m. every single day so we could do homework in the car and my dad as well like he just knows so much about the sport and he's been our he was our first coach and um, just taught us honestly like I feel like both Ari and I uh, pride ourselves in our water polo IQ and that's entirely from my dad like he's just so intelligent about the game and I feel really lucky to have seen the sport through his eyes and I think the Laguna Beach community as a whole honestly has been really lucky to have him. It, he played at a very high level right I mean you think about the run he put together not only in college but to be a multiple time Olympian and then to watch what you guys have done is he, is he almost a bit in awe of, of what you two have been able to accomplish? I mean, on paper, right, you, you did it at a higher level than he did when you talk about winning. It has to be, I can't imagine as a, as a parent, it has to be like the best thing ever to watch your kids do that at such a high level. Yeah, I think, I think he's through the moon to watch it. Like, he clearly loves water polo. Um, and I think, I mean, I think he played at just as high of a level as us. Yeah. Um, and I think that he knows so much about the game, but it's been really cute to see how excited he is about how far Ari and I have gotten in the sport um, and to see the pride he has for that. And then, of course, the jokes that come with it. Um, Aria and I are always sure to knock him down a couple pegs when we need to, <laughs> just for fun. But yeah. You guys are great on Instagram, really just chopping him down a few pegs <laughs> if he ever gets too full of himself. So. The thing is, he doesn't have an ego at all, but we like to pretend he does. <laughs> So you're a year out of this playing at a very high level. Have you been able to, or maybe you don't want to, have you had to replicate the feeling that being on a team has given you? Are you happy to be away from that? How have you handled the last 12 months? Yeah, it's been interesting. I think I've been really lucky because I'm a part of uh, the product realization lab at Stanford, which is 
like there's like 24 or 25 of us CAs and we're working to like keep a machine shop running so it feels like a team aspect but it's not competitive so I was joking to Aria the other day is a lot of the CAs have been like oh you're not very competitive like we're kind of surprised and then I played pickleball actually with Ryan and <laughs> Flo another girl on the Stanford team and Ryan had hurt her elbow so she was playing with her left hand and she was on my team and I was getting so frustrated and I was like Ryan girl you pick up the slack and yeah. so it was kind of fun to get a little competitive so I yeah. think I do miss the competitiveness and, and all my teammates yeah. but it's been nice that I have a community aspect as well so Last thing, I asked Arya about this as well. Over your careers together, and I know there's only been a time or two where you weren't playing on the same team, but you guys have won a ridiculous amount. I mean, I was estimating for Arya, maybe for you too. Is it fair to say that like, maybe you've lost less than 30 games in your whole life? <laughs> That's like, maybe, that might be true. <laughs> maybe, who knows? What, what have you learned about winning that you will try and bring to the rest of your life? It's a very broad question. <laughs> Gonna send you out with a with a big one yeah, here, a big a, a big one. picture one. Um, I don't know. I think I don't know if this is answering your question, but I think I've always been the kind of person to be like, it's nice to lose every once in a while to remember how good winning feels because I think, especially on the national team, it just felt like at a certain point that it was expected of us yeah. and it some of the sweetness of winning got taken away. So while it sucks to lose in the moment, and I always told the Stanford team this is like sometimes you you need to lose to feel how good it is to win so I think maybe just perspective for the rest of my life is like when things are a little bit hard knowing that maybe that when things are a little bit sweeter that it will feel even that much sweeter but I feel like you have to have some some of both to understand how sweet things can be this is this is filed under the sunny days wouldn't mean so much if it wasn't for the rain <laughs> exactly, exactly. Fish thanks for being here of always course. always gonna talk with thanks, you and uh, we'll talk to you soon thanks, all right we'll take a time out and come back with more one yellow yellow now blue no orange now blue Welcome back to the Olympic Club here in San Francisco. What an awesome night this has been. It's not every year that we get so many finalists in the room. They often have national team commitments, uh, whether it's here with Team USA or abroad. So, so cool that we've had five of the six here in the room. We've heard from all of them. Of course, after we learn who the winners are, we'll try and pull them in once again, if they're here in the room, to try and get their thoughts on winning college water polo's most prized possession. But just to kind of reset things here, Who's joining us. We're here at the Olympic Club in San Francisco. Greg Mesco here with you for USA Water Polo. And we are handing out Water Polo's biggest honor. So let's talk about this award, how it relates across the college landscape. If you're familiar with the Heisman Trophy, many are. That's college football's biggest honor. The Naismith Trophy in basketball, 
Hobie Baker, the list goes on and on. Herman Award, these are the ways other sports recognize their elite level athletes. In water polo, it's the Catino Award named after the Cal legend, Peter J. Catino, the now late coach, the Hall of Famer who won multiple titles with the Bears. And uh, it's been around since the late 90s and continues here in our, I believe our 23rd year uh, at our ceremony this year. So. Again, that's how this award stacks up. How is it decided? It's voted on by the college coaches. So each coach in each gender gets a chance to vote. So all the women's head coaches vote for the women. All the men's head coaches vote for the men. In some cases, there is overlap, of course, at places like uh, USC and UCLA, among other programs. And that's how we determine our finalists. Also new this year, the Catino Award watch list. We recognize 20 outstanding athletes from programs around the country. That was announced early in the season of each season, men's and women's debuting for the first time in the 22 men's season. And again, that was a separate process. As it turns out, a lot of those names are names you're talking about here tonight, but those voting processes were separate. But a great chance to honor water polo athletes from around the country that might not be considered for the final award. So in those watch lists, you have programs from around the country, Salem, George Washington, Fordham being recognized that don't get a chance to maybe be here in the room at the very end of the season. So that was a great, great new addition here to the water polo scene. Let's talk past winners. We're gonna hear from one shortly. Cammie Craig is our keynote speaker. She won this award twice. As you see on the screen, it is not uncommon to have a repeat winner. Potential tonight, Nikolaus Papanikolaou, last year's winner for the men, he's a finalist here. On the women's side, well, we could have a Fisher win it again, but it'd be Aria Fisher. Mackenzie Fisher has won it, of course, before representing the Stanford Cardinal. Tony Azevedo, four-time winner on the men's side. Uh, the list goes on. Bala Shurde won twice for the University of the Pacific. Ruel D'Souza, a finalist here for UOP. So, a look at some of the past winners. It is a who's who of water polo excellence. There are a lot of Olympic medals on that list as well. We've got athletes now, we've been doing this so long, Hall of Famers have been inducted to the USA Water Polo Hall of Fame. A good reminder, USA Water Polo Hall of Fame coming up next Friday, June 9th in Pleasanton. A great class going in, including a Latino Award winner in Coralie Simmons. So, it all ties together in this water polo community. Let's tell you about our finalists tonight. Again, if you're just joining us, six finalists on the women's side, two from Stanford, Aria Fisher and Ryan Neuschel, fresh off an NCAA title. They defeated the USC Trojans. Tilly Kearns, she's back as a finalist. Didn't win last year, but up again as a finalist. Standout from Australia. She'll be back with USC again in the future. On the men's side, Jake Earhart capping a stellar five-year run with USC as a finalist. He's also a part of Team USA. We mentioned Nicolas Papanikolaou trying to repeat, coming off a stellar year for the Cal Bears. Seven goals in the end save final. He told us here tonight, it was a blur. We remember it crystal clear. Seven goals. He went off in the fourth quarter to help the Bears to rates a four-goal deficit. And then Raul D'Souza from the University of the Pacific coming off a great sophomore season, going to help guide that UOP squad into the West Coast Conference after he returns from a redshirt season as he'll be with Team Canada as they try and qualify for the Paris Olympics. So that's what's ahead here tonight. We have our keynote speech with Cammy Craig. Then we'll, of course, get a look at our nominees a little bit closer. Highlight videos of all six. Our MC Prince Tours will reveal who our winners are. We'll hear from those winners. And then ideally we'll have them right back here at our desk to talk about what it means to win college water polo's highest honor. Now, we have another commercial coming up, but we gotta talk about one other item in the water polo world, Junior Olympics. It's the world's biggest tournament. It's only getting bigger. It's back this summer, three big sessions. It's back in Southern California and back in Texas. It starts in mid-July, finishes at the end of the month. Sessions one and two, Orange County will be home. Session three, Dallas, Texas, North Texas, as they call it, will be the site. But for the first time, we are pre-selling a custom Junior Olympics t-shirt featuring none other than, for my money, the most beloved mascot in sports, Shieldy. And we have it here for you. This shirt 
is on sale now. Yes, I'm hawking t-shirts, we have time. It's on sale now if you go to usawaterpolo.org and head to the store or go to waterpologear.com, you can get this official shirt. If you've been to JO's, you know that Shieldy is beloved. Get your shirt now, order it today, you can be wearing it to Junior Olympics. So I promise we won't hawk any more merchandise and have to share that one new custom t-shirt. We'll step aside once more and then I think we're trying to round up Chris Torres. He is a man of the people. I have to try and pull him away from his adoring fans and see if we can get him back to the podium to get our show started. We'll take one more time out and return here to San Francisco. Ladies and gentlemen, Apparently this is this still is an award show, not a social club. So if we can if we can move this along, there's some people who are very excited about handing out some hardware today. God Kruger, dear goodness. Ladies and gentlemen, now I have the privilege of introducing tonight's keynote speaker. 
Cammie Craig is a performance and culture coach who specializes in helping elite athletes, coaches, and teams through complex challenges to reach their performance goals. And I don't know what that means either. <laughs> but before that, Cammy was simply one of the best water polo players of hers or any generation. Yeah, that's worth, that's worth applause, right? There. Now, I'm just gonna touch on the highlights of her resume because if I did everything, we'd be here until 11 o'clock and the help would have to go into overtime. That's a problem. After 13 years on the women's national water polo team, she is a multiple-time collegiate All-American, NCAA champion, an Olympic silver medalist, a two-time Olympic gold medalist, a three-time world champion, a three-time Pan American champion, a two-time World Cup champion, and oh yeah, she won the Catino Award two times. <laughs> I'm not an architect, but I'm wondering where the heck do you keep all those trophies and awards? Since retiring from the national team, Cami has turned her attention to paying things forward. She co-founded Camps for Champs, whose mission is to empower and inspire young women through the sport of water polo. She's also mentored hundreds of youth athletes through Rise Athletes, where her work has been praised as both transformational and inspiring. In addition to all these accolades, Cami's a certified neurotransformational coach. And I am looking forward to all our neuros being transformed this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, I couldn't be happier to introduce Cami Craig. Oh my goodness, that was really great. Thank you for that introduction. Um, wow, there's so many wonderful familiar faces in the crowd and for those of you who are new faces, it's a pleasure to meet you. Um, hi. <laughs> I want to thank the Olympic Club for always hosting a memorable event specifically for our athletes and nominees here. I also would like to uh, just acknowledge the Catino family and it is such a, a privilege to celebrate the legacy of your father, Peter Catino, um, and be here tonight and always have his spirit and legacy around this award. As I was preparing for tonight, I went ahead and took a look at the list of Catino Award winners on the women's side. And in 1999, this award debuted. And in 1999, uh, I started playing water polo. And as I, <laughs> okay, yes, <laughs> cool. <laughs> um, and as I looked at the list of award winners, I realized that I have either been coached by, played against, or played alongside of every single woman on that list. That's what I said. <laughs> And as I looked at the men's side, I realized I walked alongside a handful of them at Olympic uh, opening ceremonies, shared a collegiate campus with, or covered their play for Pac-12 as a color commentator. So as that sunk in, I realized I've been around this sport for a little while. <laughs> and kind of challenge myself to get comfortable taking up that space in the history books of water polo in the US. And one thing that is important to know about me is I'm the only athlete in my family. <laughs> I'm the first in my family to graduate from college. So athletics and representing a university, thank you, yes, <laughs> for all of our first generation grads here. Um, so Athletics and representing a university was actually quite novel for me and my family. So when I was at events like this, whether it was you know, at the tables where old teammates got to get together or speakers at different events, I was with curiosity and in awe leaning in and listening to every story and every word that was being told. It was in rooms like this that I started to learn about the culture and history of water polo. It was through coaches and teammates that I really started to figure out what the fabric looked like. 
there's generation, I mean, the Fishers, a dad that played at the Olympics and two daughters that followed in the footsteps, the Nuschel family. I mean, you girls hold it down in Santa Barbara. I've always <laughs> loved watching you guys grow up and play. But my history was really built uh, within walls like this. So with that being said, I figured I would honor our athletes tonight by sharing a personal story and contributing to the history of water polo. So I wanted to talk a bit about um, my senior year um, and, and my Picatino Award uh, event and how it all went. Okay, so 2010, I was a senior and co-captain at USC with a teammate, Tamua and I. We were both nominated for the Catino Award and we were both training with the women's national team at the time. I know a lot of our athletes in the room have either, you know, competed with their national team, represented their country, and they're balancing uh, being a top collegiate athlete and being on their national teams as well. So the way that the women's season ends, typically you're battling at NCAAs, and then within a week you are competing alongside of those you were just battling at a training camp. So Tamu and I were participating in a training camp and the day of the event, we had morning practice. So the plan was to go to practice in Long Beach, then get in the car, drive to LAX, jump on a flight, come to San Francisco, and enjoy this event. The plan was that Adam was going to let us out early for practice, and we would follow the plan as, as it was. Surprise, surprise. We were not let out of practice early and the practice went long. So all of a sudden, our time to get to the airport became very, very tight. When we got released to practice, both Tamu and I ran to the car, changed out of our bathing suits in the car, and started to move slowly down the freeway in LA towards LAX. As we were in the car, Tamu, the calm, sounding voice that she always was. She's a goalie, and I'm not really great at defense, so I always was made sure I was close with my goalies. Um, but her calming voice in the car was telling me what the plan was gonna be. So I'm leaning in, she goes, okay, we're gonna get there, you're gonna take my backpack, you're gonna get through security, you're gonna get to the gate, and you're gonna do your best to stall this flight from taking off. Then I'm gonna go drop off the car, get in the shuttle, and I'll meet you there. You got it, Tamua. <laughs> So we pull up, you know, curbside. I get out with both the backpacks on. I get to security. Line is long, but it's moving per usual. It's LAX. And I get to the gate, and I'm like just staring anxiously at the hallway, just waiting for Tamu to appear. And I'm like, she's got to make it. She's got to make it. She's got to make it. And I'm getting updates along the way, and she's like, just dropped off the car. Perfect. Just waiting for the shuttle. Excellent. On the shuttle. Great. The shuttle just broke down. No, we don't have time for the shuttle to break down, right? And so I'm calling her, I'm like, what's up? And I can hear her thudding, like breathing hard and thudding. She is now running down the sidewalk, curbside to our terminal so that she can get to security and come through. And you know, I know we're all athletic beings here, um, but I knew once she started to hit the ground running, she wasn't gonna make it. <laughs> And no matter how much I tried to slow that flight, she wasn't gonna make the flight. She got on the next flight. She eventually made it here to the club. I remember she threw a dress over her head and threw her hair up in a messy bun and arrived to kind of that intro mixer, smelling of chlorine, because she never got to take a shower after practice. And I share this story simply because I know the sacrifices that our athletes have had to make to be here today to be nominated for this award. What you guys balance consistently and constantly, what it takes to embody being a great teammate, what it is to appreciate fun fundamentals and details, what it is to commit and be disciplined on the road to mastery, understanding sacrifice is simply a given on the road to becoming the best, and that it's not easy. You guys are constantly, constantly balancing what it is to be aware of yourself, 
aware of your teammates, and aware of your team as a whole. To be a committed athlete to the game, but also to be a great individual outside of it. That's one small glimpse of the chaos that you live in <laughs> constantly to be the best at what you do. And that's not specific to just one individual here tonight, but that's all of the ways in which our athletes have sacrificed to be here. So I see you. I'm inspired and impressed by you. I know what you guys are up to. So raise a glass or a round of applause for all of our nominees tonight who continue to contribute to the history of water polo. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Cami Craig, one of the greatest players who ever strapped it on. <laughs> it's hard to imagine the Pac-12 network decided to go with her doing color commentary than me. I just. <laughs> Can't understand it. But now, ladies and gentlemen, for the reason we're all here, the presentation of the Catino Awards. I'd like to bring up a trustee of the Catino Awards and a guy who claims to have been quite the player in his time, Peter Conti. Yeah, claims. Oh, well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, thank you, Mr. Dorst, Cammie. Uh, fantastic, everybody. Um, birthday tomorrow. Who, mine or whose? It's not my birthday tomorrow. No. <laughs> but, but, but kind of you to call it out. <laughs> we, have, we have a loose, free-flowing at atmosphere here. If you, if, you, if you know the punchline of the joke, shout it out. It'll make it funnier for everybody. <laughs> well, <laughs> thank you all for, for being here tonight, honestly. Um, your continued support here at the Olympic Club and for this award, it's, uh, it's meaningful, uh, it's heartfelt, and um, I, ca I can't think of a better community um, to surround myself with, and I know I speak for a lot of people who are here in the room. Uh, and obviously, we're here to acknowledge uh, the best that water polo has to offer. We're here to award the 24th annual Peter J. Catino Award. So just a round of applause for that. I was going to say, you're, you're here. You did it. You showed up. You, uh, you got a babysitter. You left a pet, maybe even a kid at home with a stranger. I mean, that's no small thing. You showered. Well, most of us. You shaved, you, you, you put it all together, you're making friends with somebody, you're sitting at a table with somebody you might have had a grudge with you know, that many years ago at that one important game. But you don't really talk about, but you know, and they know, and uh, you know, one of those kind of situations. <laughs> well, we're here for a few reasons, and not the least of which is, this is the night that we honor the best of collegiate water polo. And in the name of the mo one of the most celebrated coaches in all of water polo, Mr. Peter J. Catino. He's a former coach at UC Berkeley, a former coach and member here at the Olympic Club. And uh, I have a few stats I'm gonna run through in just a minute here, but give me a sec to get through the rest of this. Uh, but we're also here in large part to celebrate the sport that we play, the sport that we love so much. We play tribute uh, to the legacy that it leaves us with. Water polo is more than just the championships. It's more than the honors, and it's more than the statistics that get marked up in columns. It's a family, and that's effectively what we have here, believe it or not. It's former players becoming coaches and high school kids, and some of you are here today. You're getting to meet honest-to-God role models and potentially heroes for your careers. I don't say that lightly. There's a table over here with some players who have been playing together for 45 years, and we're about to go to Japan and continue to play together for a championship for the world chess. So. That's the kind of legacy that you have embarked upon and that you get to be a part of now. It's, it's no small thing. 
Um, it's the inevitable intertwining of community and the celebration of our friends and loved ones that brings us here and together. And the, for you in the room and for some people who are watching here online, we hope this celebration uh, of excellence in our sport that we always promise and we always attempt to at least deliver here from the Olympic Club. Uh, the award itself, and it's right here in case you were all wondering, that's the pose that was mentioned earlier that's <laughs> hard to get into. The Peter J. Catino Award was created here at the Olympic Club in 1999 and it was formed as a partnership. It was between the Board of uh, Trustees and the club's executive membership and the team itself. And the concept was, look, we need a high level of award that awards the best of collegiate water polo. And I know this is gonna be shocking to people and especially in a society where there's a lot of awards, maybe too many awards, we could argue. But this was a rare thing, this didn't exist. And um, water polo was, arguably has been maybe nothing but the better for it. And it's part of the reason why the names that grace the trophy are, are so auspicious in general. They're, they're champions, not just in the pool, but they've continued to be uh, vibrant members of the community ever since. And Cammie's a perfect example of that. So maybe one more round of applause for her as well. This is the part of the speech that I usually read verbatim, so I'll do a little bit of that. But I really like the quote from uh, Peter Uberoff. Uh, he was the initial and inaugural speaker of this award, where he claimed this was the Heisman Trophy for water polo. It's, there's not a better moniker than that. We all know what the Heisman Trophy is because of all the obvious reasons, but this really becomes, and uh, we like to think of it as, you know, the most elevated way in which we can celebrate the excellence in our sport. Uh, Coach Catino, he was a force in water polo, both you know, on the pool deck and outside of it. Uh, and a lot of young players' lives were transformed because of it. Um, his inspirational style and mastery of the game uh, was arguably second to none. I count myself as lucky, having been coached by him for one quick summer there, way back when. Um, I'm going to, like I said, uh, have to read verbatim here for a moment, just so that I can get these statistics right, because there's some argument, but I don't think it's very widely done, that he was one of the winniest water polo coaches of all time, and I like that moniker for a guy of his stature and of his import. So, uh, Katina was a 25-year coach at UC Berkeley, an Olympic head coach in 1976, and among many other esteemed positions uh, and achievements, his college teams earned eight national championships. He had a 519 to 172 in 10 career record, his last team in 1988 won a school record 33 games on the way to a second straight NC2A title. Catino coached 68 All-Americans, six Pac-10 and NC2A Players of the Year, five Olympians, and that is obviously quite a number. His no-nonsense style was tough but fair, uh, and his Italian blood ensured that he was very vocal during most of those games. <laughs> uh, my favorite quote about Pete Catino uh, is from one of his former players and current Cal coach, Mr. Kirk Everest, right here. And I use this one every year because I think it's so apt. He taught us that anything worth accomplishing would not come without discomfort. And he was always there to administer the discomfort. <laughs> coach Catino was a firm believer that hardship and adversity made people stronger. Success was not measured by singular events and sports could reveal and illuminate character. And we have a video that some of you are uh, familiar with, but we'll make sure to play it now. The Olympic Club of San Francisco is one of the oldest athletic clubs in the United States. Founded in 1860, it serves men and women of all ages by enriching their lives through participation in the club's wide range of fitness programs, organized sports, and social activities. At the club, there is a strong tradition of Olympic competition dating back over a century. Since the games of the Third Olympiad, hosted by St. Louis in 1904, Olympic Club members have competed for their home countries, bringing home numerous medals, almost half of them gold. With a long and illustrious history in the sport of water polo, dating back to the turn of the 20th century, the Olympic Club is proud to celebrate the sport of water polo by annually recognizing the female and male collegiate water polo players of the year. And it's been said, it's really true, the greatest names in the history of our sport are here tonight. They truly are. And they are a team, and they are a family, and tonight you join their ranks. You know, in sport, sport is something we take too serious, and other times not serious enough. To me, it seems to reflect a noble 
a notable sentiment that those that sacrifice the most to achieve a goal are the happiest of people. Embracing both the sport of water polo and one of its legends, Peter J. Catino, the Olympic Club formed the Peter J. Catino Award in 2000, celebrating the very best in collegiate water polo. The namesake of this award is one of the winningest coaches in water polo history, winning 13 U.S. water polo and 8 NCAA championships during his 26-year career as head water polo coach at the University of California at Berkeley. Peter Catino was named NCAA Coach of the Year four times and nurtured 68 NCAA All-Americans, six NCAA Players of the Year, and five Olympians. As coach for the Olympic Club, Peter Catino coached over a 12-year span, winning four U.S. Open National Championships, two World Masters titles, and 10 Masters National Championships. Four of his players received U.S. National MVP honors, and eight players would go on to become U.S. Olympians. Respected and admired by his peers for his knowledge of the game and ability to develop, motivate, inspire, and be a role model for his athletes, Peter Catino was inducted into the USA Water Polo Hall of Fame in 1997 and the Olympic Club Hall of Fame in 2007. You know, it's true that the problems of victory are more agreeable than those of defeat, but they are no less difficult. Let me explain it to you. You are, tonight, recipients you are the champions, to be the champion. The champion becomes the mark, the standard to achieve, to beat. The greatest effort is against the champion. Moral victories are gained against the champion. And if the champion, champion perseveres, then the pressures become that much greater. It is a tough, tough road to hold, but it is as it should be. It is competition, which is the basis of excellence. I, I, I was, they cut me off. I guess that means my time is almost done. You guys want to hear about who wins, right? All right, real quick. There's a member board of trustees that oversees this particular process and this award. This isn't just slapdash, contrary to what you might have seen up here for the rest of the, the so far this, to this evening. Um, this, this, this trustee uh, board, they, uh, they're here to properly care for the award. It's an annual celebration tonight. These are all obvious things. Um, a quick extra thank you uh, and word of thanks to Eva and Whitney, who uh, did a lot of the work behind the scenes to make this happen. One of the things, and I, and I, I don't want to bring it up and put too, hard, um, too much of an emphasis on it, but the member board of trustees that oversees this, we're simply here to make sure that the award is done fairly and transparently. We do not have a hand in selecting any of the players or uh, guiding the process in any way. The greatest part about this award, and part of the reason I'm so honored to be able to present it tonight, is that it's voted on by the community of water polo players themselves, the coaches, the former winners of this award. We're simply here to make the process transparent and honest. Um, and to my mind, that makes it the, the best possible part of this award, is that these are the representatives this year voted on by you the community of water polo players to represent them on the national stage from the collegiate, the best of the collegiate teams. So again, one last congratulations on that front. I'm gonna be self-indulgent for a moment. I'm gonna introduce you to the trustees in case you don't know them or you wanna know who to point a finger and throw the tomatoes at later. So I'll go through them very quickly. Over here, uh, Ms. Julia Sesnick. I believe it's over here, Mr. Chris Lathrop. Morgan Kirkpatrick. She's not here. Mr. Colin Mulcahy. Ms. Gina Castanola. The Executive Director of the Catina Award and the Club's Athletic Director, Mr. Nick Luson. Mr. Marin Ballerin. And I'm technically a member as well. So. All right, so now the moment we've all 
been waiting for. This is the reason we're here, is to announce the actual winners. So uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go through everybody uh, who's been nominated, and then we're gonna see some videos, again, of some very in, uh, impressive statistics and uh, video clips. Uh, but let me just start. We'll start with the men. We're gonna announce that first, and then we're gonna get to the women, so that we, we end on the, uh, the sweeter note, so to speak. <laughs> All right, um, it's in your program, so there's not a lot of reason to, to dwell through it too, too long. Um, from the University of Southern California, Jake Earnhardt. From the University of California, Berkeley, Nicola, Papa Nicolau. And from the University of the Pacific, Raul D'Souza. The women's finalists include, from Stanford University, Aria Fisher. From the University of Southern California, Tilly Kearns. And from Stanford University, Ryan Neuschel. All right, we're gonna, we're gonna announce the men's winner here after a quick video. This is the, my cue is to point at him. As a freshman, Ruel D'Souza made an immediate impact with 25 goals, 27 assists, and 6 steals. As a sophomore, he was downright unstoppable. D'Souza had a hand in 100 of his team's points, including 54 goals scored and 46. As a freshman, Ruel D'Souza made an immediate impact with 25 goals, 27 assists, and 6 steals. As a sophomore, he was downright unstoppable. D'Souza had a hand in 100 of his team's points, including 54 goals scored and 46 assists. He notched 7 assists against number 11 UC Irvine. A few weeks later, he took it to the Anteaters again with 5 goals of his own in the GCC Championship Semifinal. D'Souza finished the year with GCC All-Conference First Team, NCAA All-Tournament Team, and ACWPC First Team All-American Honors. Steady leadership, defensive savvy, offensive prowess, these are the key elements of an elite water polo player, and Jake Earhart had them all on display in 2022. In his fifth season with the USC Trojans, Earhart found the back of the net 55 times. He recorded 19 multiple goal outings, including a career-high five goals against the fifth-ranked Stanford Cardinal. When it was all said and done, Earhart earned his fifth straight All-American honors with a first-team selection. On top of that, he finished his career as the Trojans' number six all-time leading scorer with 179 career goals. Nikolaus Papanikolaou is the very definition of dominance. He is elite. The reigning Catino Award winner proved himself reliable in the sport's biggest moments once again. In 2022, Papa Nikolaou led the Golden Bears with 62 goals, seven of which came in the national championship game. He led the conference with 80 earned exclusions and kept his defensive prowess on display with 13 field blocks. Papa Nikolaou earned ACWPC Player of the Year honors, was named to the ACWPC All-American First Team, and celebrated his second national championship. on this time is good. All right, uh, if I could have the men join me up here on stage so I can announce the winner correctly. It's rare that I feel small. <laughs> All right, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, the finalists for this year's uh, Katino Award. Yeah.
And the winner from UC Berkeley, Nicholas Papa. <laughs> Papa Nicholas. Good evening, everyone. Uh, <laughs> uh, first of all, I'd like to say that uh, the Olympic Lab has done an amazing job organizing this event. I'm so glad to be a part of it. Uh, I feel so happy and so honored to get, to get this award the uh, second consecutive year. Uh, I'd like to thank my coaches, uh, Kirk Everest and Jeff Tyrell, for uh, for being with me since uh, the beginning of uh, this uh, incredible journey and uh, they've taught me so much and you know I, I'm so I'm so thankful they, they've helped me so much uh, develop and grow as a person and as an athlete and um, will be forever grateful for them. Uh, I also want to thank the newest addition of our coaching staff, uh, Yakov, over there. You know, he's, he's been my coach for less than a year now, but I think uh, he knows me better than I know myself. Uh, he knows how to, to push me. I remember the first time uh, he, he met me, he introduced himself to me. He came up to me and he told me, hey, uh, last summer, congratulations for last year, but can you do it again or was it just luck? <laughs> and I'm so glad I took him up on this challenge. Uh, I hope he's proud uh, to be a part of this team. Uh, also, a big part of why I'm here today is my teammates. Uh, I can't thank all of them individually, but I want to say a special thanks to Jack Dilly over there. Uh, as, as Kirk likes to say, he's uh, the yin to my yang, and uh, <laughs> I, know, I know we love to joke about it, but we both know there's a little bit of truth in it. And uh, nobody can deny the special connection we had all these three, four years. And for sure, I'm going to miss his passing ability and all the fun we had at practice. Um, however, uh, today I want to dedicate this award to my, to my dad. Uh, and I know my mom is going to be a little bit upset. <laughs> but uh, I have, <laughs> I have uh, two pretty good reasons for it. Um, <laughs> My dad was the one who, when I was nine years old, he, you know, one morning, I think it was summer, he comes out to me and says, I think I found the sport more suitable for you. And I'm like, I had never heard of water polo before. I never watched, nobody in my close circle had ever watched water polo. So I wasn't sure, but I went for it. And for the next seven, eight years, uh, he was the one who would drive me and my brother to practice every day. He would spend like four or five hours every day waiting for us to, to finish till late at night, drive us back home. And growing up, I realized that, you know, it's, it's, it's a very difficult thing to do consistently and it's a lot of patience. And uh, I, I never really told him, but I'm so grateful and uh, I, I love him for whatever he has done and I appreciate him uh, because there's a 0% chance that I'll play, I would play, I'll be playing water polo let alone be here with you today if it wasn't for him. Uh, and on top of that, uh, today it's his birthday. And uh, <laughs> and I, I never know what to get him, so happy birthday, Dad. That's hard not to love. <laughs> All right, we're halfway through. Let's get to the women. I believe we have a video for the women, but it's on cue this time. You ready? I'm going to point and it's going to happen. Ready? These are your women finalists. If you give the ball to two-time Olympic gold medalist Aria Fisher, she will find the back of the net. It's a guarantee. 
In 2023, she recorded 20 multiple goal games, including a seven goal outburst against number 18, Indiana. She lit up the scoreboard with a conference best 115 points for the Cardinal, including 71 goals and 44 assists. Fisher proved tough on defense as well, with 32 steals, 13 field blocks, and 73 earned exclusions. She earned MPSF and NCAA Tournament MVP honors and led Stanford to a second straight national championship. The ACWPC Player of the Year, Fisher ended her career on the farm as Stanford's number five all-time scorer with 226 career goals. Tilly Kearns is the beating heart behind a dynamic USC squad, and in 2023, she made her presence known. Kearns racked up 69 goals, drew 35 exclusions, and added 35 steals for the Trojans, and she carried that prowess into the postseason. In the national championship game alone, Kearns scored twice, drew two exclusions, and recorded one assist. By the end of the season, she earned NCAA All-Tournament, All-MPSF, and ACWPC All-American First Team Honors. The 2023 season made one thing abundantly clear. Ryan Neuschel cannot be stopped. She plays her game with a persistent grit that elevates her team to the next level. Neuschel recorded 65 goals and 44 assists for a whopping 108 total points. She led her team with 21 multiple goal games that included all three games of the NCAA tourney. Neuschel also posted a notable 18 field blocks and drew 35 exclusions. She earned a spot on the NCAA All-Tournament First Team following an MPSF First Team selection in addition to winning a third national championship. Neuschel was also an ACWPC First Team All-American selection. All right, if I could have the ladies please join me up here on stage. And your winner for the 2023 Peter Jacatino Award for the women from Stanford University, Aria Fisher. <laughs> referees didn't get to vote on this one. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> First, I just want to thank the Olympic Club for hosting this wonderful event. I'm honored to be at the celebration of an award that holds so much legacy and history in the sport of water polo. I want to take a minute to recognize my fellow nominees who are both more than worthy of this award. Tilly is a dominant force in the center of the pool and it's been a privilege to compete against her these past few years. Ryan, you're the most passionate, determined teammate I've ever had. You play a gritty, whatever it takes type of water polo that almost always goes unrecognized, but is absolutely vital to any championship team. I've never had a teammate who I've been more compatible with <laughs> in and out of the pool, and I'll miss playing with you. So many people, oh, thank you. <laughs> Ryan. So many people have supported me to get to where I am today. Um, my dad was my first coach and volunteered countless hours of his own time to make me better. Dad, your advice throughout the years, although most of the time unsolicited, <laughs> was always spot on. <laughs> my mom do drove me countless hours to national team practices while I did homework in the back seat with the help of a headlamp. 
<laughs> Mom, you were the only one who truly believed I could make the 2016 Olympic team when I took a leap of faith to follow my dreams. Thank you both for your unwavering support. Thank you to my Oma, who came to every game and was unanimously dubbed Team Grandma on every one of my teams. Thank you to my sister, Mackenzie, for graduating so I could win this award. No, but honestly, Mackenzie is not only one of the best water polo players to have ever played the game, but she did so with a humble stoicism that I've always looked up to and never been able to master. <laughs> Mackenzie, I found it hard to put into words just how much you mean to me in my water polo journey. You've always been the best sister in and out of the pool. The single thing I'm most thankful to water polo for is for how close it made us as sisters. <laughs> Thanks to all the teammates I've had over the years who always lifted me up and put a smile on my face. A special shout out to my Stanford teammates, many of whom are here today to support Ryan and me. You guys are the best. I'm thankful to every coach I've had along the way, high school, club, college, and national team. Without you, none of my success is possible. Thank you to my high school coach, Ethan D'Amato, who's one of the most passionate and supportive coaches I know. I can't thank jo coach John Tanner, Susan Ortwine, Kyle Atsumi, and Kim Kruger enough <laughs> for the impact they've had on me at Stanford these past years. If you told me two years ago I'd be standing on the stage accepting this Katino Award, I would have laughed at you. Because the truth is, two years ago, coming back from the Tokyo Olympics, I absolutely hated water polo. <laughs> Slowly, day by day, with the support of the coaching staff at Stanford and my Stanford teammates, I started to find the joy in the game again. I owe a large part of this reclaimed joy to JT. Not only does he excel at the tactical and strategic aspects of the game, but he also truly understands how to support his athletes through the tough times in their careers. To JT, the athlete isn't an expendable claw, a cog in the machine that churns out championships, but rather a person who is important outside of what they do for water polo. To JT, I wasn't just an athlete, I was first and foremost a human being. JT should be an example to all of us on how to lead with compassion and how to find success doing it. <laughs> I love that man. It's not an easy decision to retire from a sport knowing that athletically you have more to give. But ultimately, I'm proud of myself for always placing my happiness and my mental health above everything else and for knowing when it's time to let go. Ah. <laughs> Water polo has given me fr friendships and memories that will last a lifetime and I'll always be grateful for my journey through the sport. Most importantly, water polo has pushed me to grow as a person in ways I didn't even think possible and I'm so proud of the woman I've become. I'm incredibly honored to be receiving this award. Thank you. And a final round of applause for both our winners tonight. All right, to close this out, I'm handing it right back to the one and the only, MC with the most, Chris Dorst. Well, if, if you're not inspired by this, folks, you don't have a pulse, I'm sorry. Congratulations to everybody who was a part of this, to Will, to Jake, to Nick, to, uh, you know, Aria, Ryan, wherever Tilly is. This, it's it just very, very special time. I've seen a lot of these, and it was just a remarkable, remarkable time. So thank you all. Ladies and gentlemen, one big round of applause for these great athletes. <laughs> you know, we, we talk about it a lot, but you guys are role models. You guys are people that the youngsters are looking up to. You guys are the ones that others want to emulate. And I can't tell you how proud I am to be part of this, this organization and part of this award ceremony to be able to see from year to year to year how wonderful these things come together in, in, in the content. Water polo started well before I was involved and is going to be, keep going well after I'm involved. But it's moments like this and people like you that it builds upon. 
that just keeps getting better and better. You stand on the shoulders of some of the greatest players that ever lived, and that allows you to be the greatest player that ever lived up till now. And in five or 10 years, people will be going, I remember when the Fisher sisters dominated this for a couple, three years. I remember when Nick won it for a couple of years in a row. I remember this, I remember that. Those kids are watching you. And I, I, I just, I am so proud to be part of a group like this. Thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our formal program. I want to thank the Olympic Club once again. Charles, the sound guy, you rock. Greg Meskel, the hardest working man in show business. Making it happen with the USA Water Polo live stream. Next year, first weekend in June, we're going to be right back here, ladies and gentlemen. We look forward to seeing you all there. Thank you all. God bless and drive safely. time to become a water polo referee. The sport continues to grow nationwide and refs are a vital part of that expansion. Join today. Whether you played for years or are new to the sport, all are welcome. Stay active with flexible hours while making extra money with competitive rates nationwide. Build a network of new friends that will last a lifetime, all while making a positive impact on youth sports. Make a difference in water polo. Become a referee today. Visit usawaterpolo.org referee to learn more. At the Olympic Club, winners announced, repeating Nikolaus Papa Nikolaou here in the room this year. What was it like to be here and receive this award and make your speech? I see it so much different. Let me tell you, last year 
I watched it. Uh, I watched it online. Uh, it's like six, seven a.m. right now in Greece, yeah. and I, I had to stay up all night because I didn't know when they're yeah. gonna announce it. But for sure, it feels uh, so much uh, better. You see all those people. You get inspired by, by, by so many Olympians. They, they stood up. I, I didn't know we had so many Olympians in the building, but for sure, that's uh, very inspiring. And uh, I'm, I'm just uh, so happy I get to, I get to win it uh, a second year in a row. It, it, Definitely means a lot, and uh, yeah, it's just a completely different experience. This uh, this event is uh, truly like uh, amazing. You uh, gave a shout out to your dad. Happy happy birthday, right, to Mr. Papa Nicolau. Mm -hmm. You talked about it a little bit, but the impact he had on your water polo career, as you said up there, it doesn't exist if not for him. Oh, 100 percent. Yeah, it's uh, since the beginning, like. I had tried uh, a couple of sports. I, I was swimming for uh, three, four years. I tried soccer. Soccer wasn't for me. Uh, and then uh, it's just as, as I said, he just out of nowhere he came up with water polo. I don't know how. Uh, I don't know how it came into his head, but I, I guess yeah. And after that, I, there there were a lot of times when I when I felt like water polo was too much because. In any other sport in Greece, you just you can practice when you're like 10, 11 years old. You can practice three times a week and still be in shape. Water polo is not like that. You have to practice every day. So there were a lot of times when I was uh, younger that I didn't want to go to practice, but he was the one pushing me and he was the one, you know, who was uh, more more dedicated and he wanted me to keep on going because pro. I don't know. I don't know why. Maybe he had seen something. <laughs> so you're gonna give this to him when you go home? Oh uh, yeah, for sure. And so where will this be? And in your in your house, you think? I'm pretty sure it's gonna be uh, right in the living room. Uh, we have a pretty pretty nice uh, place to put it, so you know everybody everybody can see. It. Very nice. <laughs> we talked about your teammate Jack Dealy up there. What what has he meant to you in and out of the pool? Uh, like it, it, for anyone who watches the games, understands what I said about uh, the special connection I have with him. I I, I, I never had a teammate who who understood. Just the, the slightest of facial expression, like like in the in a matter of a, a split second, right? And uh, we developed that, of course. The first year wasn't like that. The second year, like COVID year, wasn't. We were getting better, but my junior year, it wasn't the same. Like he 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 knew what I was thinking, and I knew what he was thinking. The the, the best example I can think of right now is uh, in the final, uh, the, the the pass, the 12-11. He passed it to the post. I I, I was so tired. But I knew, by, based on his face, that he's going to pass the ball. <laughs> and I was kind of like, no, my God, I don't have the strength. <laughs> but I, at, the, at the same time, I knew he was going to pass it. So for sure, he means a lot. He meant a lot inside the pool. And for sure, I'm going to miss a big part of my game. Because for, my, my game is not going to be the same without him. And Kirk knows it. Uh, everybody knows it. Other teams knows it, know it. But the thing is, for sure, we have to develop uh, a develop, uh, different kind of... Uh, Offense for next year, and outside the pool, like we were, we were very close. He's a, he's a fun dude to hang around, and for sure, every day, we would, even even if we're at the worst mood, we would find something to, to joke about. That's excellent. Well, uh, congrats for tonight. Don't worry about the offense or next year. This is a chance to celebrate uh, with you. your your friends and family, and uh, appreciate you being here. We'll see you in the fall. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. Have a good we'll take a time out. We'll check in with Ari Official when we come back. Hey.
Which one? Yellow? Yellow. Now blue? No, orange. Now blue. There's no better time to become a water polo referee. The sport continues to grow nationwide and refs are a vital part of that expansion. Join today. Whether you played for years or are new to the sport, all are welcome. Stay active with flexible hours while making extra money with competitive rates nationwide. Build a network of new friends that will last a lifetime, all while making a positive impact on youth sports. Make a difference in water polo. Become a referee today. Visit usawaterpolo.org referee to learn more. And welcome back, now joined by the women's winner, Aria Fisher, congratulations. Thank you so much. So to, to now have this award, how does this just kind of put a bow on the whole water polo experience? Yeah, it's great. It's great to get uh, recognized for your accomplishments, but honestly, uh, Tilly and Ryan both more than worthy of this award, and uh, my teammates really helped make this, this season uh, great and helped us propel us to the championship and put a bow on it that way. So yeah, it feels like a collective award. Uh, your speech was wonderful, kind of hit all, all the emotions, all the feels, as they might say. You, you talked about John Tanner a bit, and I'm not trying to make you cry or anything, but like, just a little bit more about how, how he made this fun for you again. Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, he just, uh, he let me take a break after Tokyo, and I think uh, that was something that was new for him, new for me, but I took several weeks off after Tokyo and didn't practice at all. And that space away from water polo was really helpful. And him just being like, yeah, this is probably not the best for the team, you taking a break, but it's best for you as a person. That was huge. And then I, JT is one of the funniest people I know. He gets a bad rap for humor, but he is so funny, <laughs> low key funny. And uh, so just bringing that humor every day to the pool and really valuing us as human beings first and really prioritizing things like mental health on our team. Um, he's done a great job of that these past few years. Was there a game or a time when you were back in the pool after you did get back to practice yeah. where you felt like, oh man, like I'm loving this again? Yeah, Does something I, stand out? I think it was just little moments. Yeah. Um, little moments in the pool. And I think I attribute that to my teammates as well, where we would just, you know, Skylar Jones, one of our defenders, we played against each other like almost every day in practice. And we would just, you know, do stupid stuff. Like I would splash her before reps and, you know, wrestle and stuff. And I would say she was bullying me. But just like little moments with teammates in between reps um, where you like get to have fun. And, and I think humor is a great tool in championship teams as well. Now, we talked with Mackenzie earlier, and I said, you know, you're a year out of this. How are you filling the competitive void? And yeah. she said her classmates have told her that she's actually not that competitive, it seems. She says she is, of course. Yeah. But that in a pickleball match, things yeah. got heated. Yeah. Where, where will you go to 
to feed that competitive fire. Well, I'll definitely play Mackenzie at yeah. Pickleball. <laughs> I have the upper hand in that one. Uh, have you Have you already played her? Yeah, we play sometimes. Okay, yeah, right. she's good, but she's uh, a little lazy sometimes Got on it. her swing. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Uh, and then you know you mentioned your parents and your dad and your mom and to kind of celebrate this with them. Yeah. How'd that feel up there? Yeah, it, it was great to have my whole family here, my whole support system. Like, a lot of the team was here, too. So it was just a fantastic way to kind of wrap up the season. And, yeah, it's fun night. Awesome. Aria, well, congrats. Thanks for being here, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much. All right. Aria Fisher, our Catino World Champ. Take a time now and wrap things up here from San Francisco. time to become a water polo referee. The sport continues to grow nationwide and refs are a vital part of that expansion. Join today. Whether you played for years or are new to the sport, all are welcome. Stay active with flexible hours while making extra money with competitive rates nationwide. Build a network of new friends that will last a lifetime, all while making a positive impact on youth sports. Make a difference in water polo. Become a referee today. Visit usawaterpolo.org referee to learn more. Welcome back to the Olympic Club. As we wrap things up here, what a night in San Francisco. Awesome to honor, excellent in college water polo. Two great athletes, Aria Fisher winning for the women out of Stanford University. Nikolaus Papanikolaou repeating as the men's winner out of Cal. And uh, bad news for men's water polo, he's back for another season if you're not a Cal fan. Uh, for Aria Fisher, we wish her all the best in her retirement uh, after just a tremendous run with both Stanford and Team USA. Well, that'll do it for us here tonight. I want to thank everyone here at the Olympic Club, Athletic Director Nick Luson, the rest of the staff here for uh, helping make this event happen. Our great producer, Jake Maynard, putting together all the video content, everything you see here during the show. The sports information directors at all the colleges of those finalists over at USC and Pacific and Stanford and Cal. They help provide the video and the bio information. Uh, really the unsung heroes when it comes to promoting your favorite college sports team. You should thank your SID if you uh, enjoy all the tweets and everything you see on your favorite college sports team's website. Uh, otherwise, that will do it for us here. I look forward to seeing you back here at the Olympic Club next year around this time. Uh, but for now, more water polo for Team USA. The USA women take on Greece starting June 9th. USA men host China on June 14th. More information on all those matches available at usawaterpolo.org. And this Friday, June 9th, the USA Water Polo Hall of Fame induction takes place in Pleasanton, California. More information on that available at usawaterpolo.org. That'll do it for us here this evening in San Francisco. Greg Messel saying thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time here from the Olympic Club.
Which one? Yellow? Yellow. Now blue? No, orange. Now blue. Ooh. 